Good evening, Wakefield, and welcome to the March 28th, 2022 Town Council meeting. I hereby call this meeting to order. We will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have all seven members of the council in attendance this evening. Um, we all just came from a nice recognition of our town volunteers. So it's nice to see everyone. Um, item number four, public engagement. Madam Clerk, do we have anyone for public engagement? Yes, I believe uh, we should, um, Bill Conley, um, but unfortunately, <coughs> I do not see him on. Okay, if he if he jumps on, we'll we will see if we can fit him in. Um, okay. I, item number five, approval of the minutes from the March fourteenth, twenty twenty two meeting. Um, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Uh, discussion on the minutes of March 14th. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So um, Sherry, seven to zero on that vote. Okay. Item number six, 383 Water Street update. Steve, I'll let you do the introduction, and I believe we have <clears throat> Mr. McGrail on the... Yes. Um, while Sherry's bringing uh, Mr. McGrail up, he is going to show a brief uh, PowerPoint about a lot of the um, progress that has uh, occurred over the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, I will say that um, it is very, very close, extremely close, as a matter of fact. Um, I think heeding the request of the council, I think that, that uh, the property owner and uh, the volunteers that are there are going beyond just removing items that were in our purview, which were just the uh, um, autos, the unregistered autos. And um, we, our department has been working really well between uh, Coral Hope and our health department and others really working um, with the owner of the property. Um, he will be back in there April 7th as Mission of Deeds is actually um, giving some items so he can actually use them in his house for his comfort. So that'll all be up and running. He'll be back in there um, April 7th with a great job by Coral and a great job by our volunteers, particularly 128 Plumbing and Electric that have just mm -hmm. amazing work that they've done. So we can jump back to that, but I know Mr. McGrail is here and can talk about the other Welcome, Mr. McGrail. Looking forward to well, your update. You, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the council. Uh, for the record, Attorney Brian McGrail, I represent Mr. Alwork, who's the owner of the property at 383. Uh, Water Street. As you know, this has been an ongoing matter before your uh, council. Um, you've been uh, gracious enough to extend our time. We're very thankful to you for that, uh, to give us an opportunity to uh, handle this matter on our own, uh, rather than uh, having others have to step in, which could have been catastrophic for my client and for his family. Uh, so the compassion that uh, the uh, members of the council has shown uh, and the willingness to work with my client is very much appreciated, um, and, and we're thankful for that. And we're trying to um, to to um, uh, to live up to our end of the bargain, uh, per se. Um, so, with that said, as uh, uh, Town Administrator Mayo just stated, there's been some significant progress since the last time that we met with your council, which I think was February 28th, and the weather was just starting to turn. Um, as you know, uh, Joe Surianello uh, and his son Jay have volunteered their excavator in their expertise and their time and their fuel, uh, as, as well as uh, Joe Adagner and uh, House Towing have volunteered their services and equipment also to help us out uh, and to uh, get the property cleaned up. Um, it's um, um, Basically, I think, you know, as uh, Town Administrator Mayo had mentioned, um, our order um, from the building inspector that your uh, council is now uh, holding in, in control of and has extended really relates to motor vehicles on the site. Uh, but uh, we were asked in good faith to focus on other aspects of the property, and we have done that. 
Um, there's uh, Joe Surianello has 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 um, really created debris piles and kind of for recycling with wood and metal and various other items on the site. So there's a, there's some big piles on the site that we're um, this week we will have dumpsters there to start taking some of that material off uh, appropriately. Um, so that is ongoing. Um, I can tell you that since the last meeting, two large dumpsters, very large dumpsters, have left the site with debris. Um, and then I guess more importantly, as far as uh, the discretionary matter before your council um, is the vehicles. And I'm happy to report that uh, since the last meeting of the town council, 13 large vehicles or pieces of equipment have been removed from the site. Uh, this is incredibly tedious work to accomplish this. Uh, as uh, as um, Mr. Mayor mentioned, I'm gonna uh, have a PowerPoint for you. And just to give you an idea of the scope and why time is needed for this, um, for what's happening out there. Um, uh, some of these uh, vehicles and pieces of equipment are extremely significant ex in size. They're old, they're heavy. Uh, the wheels are locked, they're frozen, so they don't turn. So when Mr. Surianello is actually dragging these to be removed from the site, the wheels aren't turning. So he has to drag them with his excavator, and that's why an excavator was needed. And there's no way a tow truck would have even dented any of these. The excavator is... Uh, is at, at its end trying to move some of this uh, equipment. Um, so what we've removed, as I've mentioned, are 13 large vehicles or pieces of equipment, including a Ford pickup truck, a yellow bulldozer, yellow dump truck, a GMC, uh, a large red uh, Chevy uh, dump truck, a Dodge power wagon truck, um, a orange soil sifter, which you'll see in, in uh, the PowerPoint, very large and extremely heavy piece of equipment. A Dodge red dump truck, old, old international red dump truck, a Chevy Blazer. Mr. Adagna was able to take that out with his tow truck when we got it uh, out to the front of the property. Uh, an old Dodge SUV that Mr. Adagna was able to take out once Joe Surianello dragged it out from the rear of the property. A massive red soil sifter, uh, a large paving machine or a roller, an old-fashioned roller, and a small roller. So um, I think it might be helpful, if I may, Madam Chair, if I could ask WCAT to put up the PowerPoint so I can give you an idea of some of the operations that have been going on at this property. So the first is, this is the, the yellow bulldozer. You can kind of see how this is, you know, was really in the property and not, you know, there's no way anything's going to pull this out. An extremely heavy piece of equipment with floating wheels, meaning they, that the suspension goes up and down, the wheels don't, all the wheels don't turn, the bucket was locked down. So Joe, had, you'll see as, as we go on that Joe had to get this with his excavator and pull it out. Um, so that was the yellow bulldozer. Next uh, slide, please. Here it is, it's been pulled out, an extremely heavy piece of equipment um, that uh, is tough to move, but we got it out. And next picture, please. And this shows you, so what, what has to happen here, these, these pieces of equipment don't go on a tow truck. Uh, tow trucks can't carry these things. They weigh way too much and they're too high. So we actually had to have a company, it's a flatbed that gets backed in. As you know, the access to this property is somewhat difficult. So this flatbed has to nurture its way into the property. Uh, and then um, these, these heavy pieces of equipment need to be loaded by Joe Surianello with his excavator. That machine is strong enough to, in many instances, pick these things right up or attach a chain to kind of gradually uh, get them on. So you can see this is the excavator uh, right next to the dozer. This is a chain that you would uh, connect to various parts to kind of nurture it onto the trailer. Very tedious, extremely time consuming to do it in a safe manner. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a uh, rigger who takes this stuff away and helps load it. Um, you can see that the, the uh, bulldozer is now on the trailer. It's all chained on for safe transportation, taken away and disposed of properly. Uh, and this is that orange uh, soil sifter that I told you about. This had to be pulled out from the rear of the property, had no wheels on it. So it's extremely difficult and heavy to get out, but Joe was able to get this out. And again, this is something that technically wouldn't be included under your order, but as we said, in good faith, we're taking uh, uh, a lot of stuff out of there uh, just to, to you know, move this in the right direction and, and get things done right. Um, next slide, please. 
This is just shows you how these are loaded on and then they're off uh, to recycling. So next. This is uh, the yellow, yellow GMC truck I talked about. You can see it had no rear end. And Joe was able to pull this out. Wheels were frozen. And then you can see when the chain, the way these have to be put on the flatbed. This was not, an all, one, this was not all one day. We've had four flatbeds uh, since February 28th. It's about a half a day event to get these loaded on uh, safely and chained on for transportation. So next, please. So you can see the yellow one is loaded. And now this is the red Chevy dump truck, which Joe is in the process. You can see his excavator um, kind of treads here. So many times he's able to lift them a little bit and actually just push them on with the blade of his excavator. So next. This shows you some of the smaller vehicles, uh, not too many, but this was, uh, this was the Ford pickup that we told you about. This actually had no rear wheels uh, on it, and Joe's able to just pick this right up with his excavator. That shows you how powerful that machine is and that it's needed for, the, for this job. Next. And, and this, this is interesting. Joe's actually uh, able to put this pickup in the bed of that truck, uh, dump truck for transportation. They strap everything down. So just a an efficient way to get more things out of there at one time. So this shows you those, you get the yellow truck, the red dump truck and the pickup truck in the bed ready to go off site. That was another day's event. Next day, these were two uh, old, new old, uh, well, two different uh, old dump trucks. This is the old Dodge and uh, International. You can see actually there's a steamroller that Joe was able to pull out that was put, that was one of the rollers that was able to go in the back of this truck this was another day. Uh, Joe had to pull both of these trucks out. They, they both had frozen wheels, so those tires don't turn. It's a, it's a process, and, and kudos to him. He really knows what he's doing and how to get this done. And the rigor that comes with the trucking company is extremely helpful, too. So this was another day, and all of this was taken off site. This is, this is just a photo of the uh, Dodge SUV that was taken about, I think, um, Councilor Dombrowski, you won the site. This was that truck that was way up on the hill that everyone said, you know, how are we going to get that down? And uh, kind of, I guess you, you try to get some humor. So when we we're on the site, Joe looked at me and he said, how are we going to get down and I, that down? And I said, I'm the lawyer. I have no idea. It's <laughs> and, and he did it. And this is his son, Jay. You know, I mean, you know, I really am, you know, just proud of the story in LA, just a great family. I mean, Joe and J Jay's in business with his dad. And here they are both volunteering and working hand in hand on how to put the chains on and just extremely cautious, safety first, the way they operate. And they were able to pull this out. And once they got that out off the hill, uh, Mr. Dagner was able to take that off to, uh, to an um, auto demo plant. So next, please. This is the red um, sifter. This is a gigantic piece of equipment that had no wheels on it. You can see here that Joe has a chain on it. Um, and Jay is kind of guiding him on how to get it out. This was an event. This took about uh, this took about three or four hours to get this out to the front of the property to have it uh, ready to go. Next, this is this, the uh, roller that I told you about that had to get loaded on. So this is Joe. You can see him, and he's loading it with the chain on the flatbed. Again, this is another day. More equipment on another day. We pretty much have been out there for two weeks straight. I've been out there every day with them, uh, working with them and working, um, you know, to make sure everything is done right. And uh, so I can keep tracks on what's going on personally. And, um, and we pretty much have gone two weeks straight. We weren't out there today with the weather, but um, we'll be back shortly. So next, please. This is that heavy uh, uh, red um, sifter that I talked about, just a very large piece of equipment. As you can see, it had no wheels on it. So dragging that out was not easy, very top heavy. And uh, this is uh, the rigger getting it onto his truck. Everything gets chained on safely for transportation to recycling and it's off. Uh, I just wanted to point out um, before I get to 128, I also want to say, and I think it's important that Mr. Alwick, who wasn't able to be here tonight, he's basically exhausted. He's been there every day himself, working, working with Joe and Jay. Uh, he has a bobcat. He's been extremely helpful. So this isn't like Joe and Jay are showing up and doing it for him or uh, Joe or Dagner. Uh, Steve Alwick is out there every day at seven in the morning, all day long, working and helping 
loading these vehicles. He was a very skilled machine operator. So he has a lot of knowledge that he instills in these young guys on getting this stuff off. So, you know, I'm really happy to report that um, he's, he's taking this on himself. He's certainly getting the help that he needs, but he's a big part of what's happening out there in the property. And I think that's important to state and, and good for him. Uh, on to 128. Um, 128 uh, Plumbing and Heating, a great Wakefield company. We hear them on the radio advertising all the time. They're so successful. Um, they have volunteered to do improvements in the house, as town administrator uh, Mayo mentioned. They've had two trucks out there every day. I was out there today. They actually had five of their vans out there today with about 10 guys working on the property uh, and, and doing all the electrical and plumbing uh, and heating. Uh, that needs to be done for Mr. Elwood to get back into the property at no charge. They're volunteering to do that. And to see that number of their personnel out there, to me, was outstanding today. So um, next, I think that's it on, on that end. Um, I'm sure the council wonders what's left. So after all that, I think good news that I reported uh, tonight is what we have in waiting. We have a backhoe uh, that has been pulled out and is waiting to be transported. Um, we have, that is left, technically not a vehicle, but we're going to get it out of there. We have uh, three pickup trucks, a box van, a Buick sedan, and a Ford, small Ford dump truck. So for vehicles, we have three pickups, a box van, a sedan, and a dump truck. So we're like six or seven vehicles. I think it's seven compared to where we've come. We've taken, as you know, so many vehicles off of there over the past month and a half. This is very attainable. Uh, the only thing is we need more time to do this because some of these vehicles are in compromised spots um, as far as being able to safely get at them. Um, there's certain other debris that we have to get out of the way first. So we're going to have to get dumpsters in there to dispose of some debris, that, debris which is going to allow uh, proper access to these vehicles in a safe manner to get them out of there. Uh, and we will get them out of there um, and get them out as quick as we can. Um, I think on one of them that we're going to need um, a crane. Um, I don't think Joe's machine will be able to deal with that. And I'm happy to report um, that um, I, I approached uh, Ray Lawton of Lott Welding, another great Wakefield resident. Uh, Ray has lived in Wakefield, raised his family here. Uh, he owns a very successful welding company in Topsfield. Uh, and, and I called Ray and I said, Ray, and told him what was going on. I said, I think we might need a crane. And he said, I've got four of them. So he said, whatever you need, uh, I'll come down to the property and figure out what size you need and I'll bring it down and I'll take care of what you need down there. So um, he, said, he, said, he said, I feel fortunate to be able to help. So I'm gonna meet Ray at the property tomorrow so we can take a look at it. Um, so that's where we are. I think we've made some great progress. Um, I think we're not there yet. You know, I think we're on the 20 yard line going in and we want to get across the goal line. Um, and I think we will. Um, so, you know, I think we're at a deadline and I will respectfully request if the, if the uh, council will consider extending this to your next meeting on April 25th. And my goal is at that point to be back here and tell you that we're done. So we're happy to answer any questions that uh, the council might have. So essentially you're looking for another 30 day more or less extension. Yeah. And a big part of that 30 days is going to be, you know, I, I, I mean, I think if you said you wanted to get the vehicles out of there in, in a week, we could do it, but it would make a mess of the property, meaning we would have debris everywhere to get at it. Um, we'd have the, we'd have the, uh, the, um, the, in order to comply, we would have the excavator just having to throw stuff aside and rather than do this in an organized fashion, to be able to get dumpsters in there and properly dispose of some of the debris. It's, just, it's kind of a, it's, it's a better process to go about it that way. I think it's better for everybody. Council Dombrowski? Uh, I'll just say, first off, thank you, Vigrell, for, for the presentation. Um, having been on the property and walked it extensively, I can say that the, the pictures I don't really think do it justice because these photos actually look better than the conditions on site. Um, things are just buried under th you know, under more items and more items. And so the fact that you see these standalone you know, um, vehicles and the like being pulled out, extracted out, I think is important. Um, I do also, we have the balancing here, and I do also want to recognize the fact that we have a lot of neighbors that have been incredibly patient during this process. And I, I'm very encouraged by what Mr. McGraw has presented tonight. 
but I also don't lose sight of the fact that these neighbors, you know, have been incredibly inconvenienced, and then they've raised considerable concern, and they're right to do so. Um, and so I don't want them to be lost in all of this. We, we're talking about the owner, but the, we also need to think about the neighbor, neighbors that, that, that are impacted by, by this. My position with this is, um, and as Mr. McGrell alluded to, I want to see us get the best end result that we can. So if we have the ability and the willingness on behalf of the owner, Mr. McGrow, to continue to not just comply as is the letter of the law, but instead go above and beyond, I have no issue with that 30 days because I think you have demonstrated considerable progress having been made. If um, the owner will commit to continuing to do that, again, on a voluntary basis, because to your point, it's not required, but I think that would go a very long way um, to address a lot of the concerns people have had. I think it will, it will end up with a better product as a result. And I don't want to just see some, a few you know, wheeled vehicles pulled off with a bunch of junk or whatever you want to call it strewn across the property. I don't think that that's the end result we're looking for here, nor do I think it's the end result the neighbors are looking for here. So I would be in favor of the 30 days, again, with the ongoing commitment, Mr. McGrell, understanding it to be a voluntary one, that um, your client will continue and the volunteers will continue to, to make best efforts to clean up this property to the greatest extent possible. That's what we're trying to do. So if we have that kind of commitment, I think it would go a long way, Mr. McGrail. Yeah, I, like I, think we've, I think we've shown that commitment, um, mm -hmm. Mr. Dombrowski. I think, um, you know, as I've said, my client's out there every day. He's committed to, um, to you know, I guess, you know, clean up the property and to, um, and to get these vehicles off. So I, I think actions speak louder than words and i think our actions to date show that that's our intention uh and it is our intention and we'll, and we'll continue to move in that in that way that's what we want to do so mr mcgrill just to um be entirely clear some weeks ago i believe we discussed uh, a black truck that was on the property is that ultimately going to be removed you had indicated it might be on a property, a part of a property dispute. Will that also be gone? That will be gone, Mr. McLean. That, yeah, that's one of the vehicles that that's one of the vehicles that I. It's a uh, one of the pickup trucks that I have referenced. That still remains, but will will also be part of the removal. Correct. Thank you. Any other discussion? I just think, Madam Chair, one other point, Mr. McGrell. Um, I know that came up. There was some issue with some glass on Water Street from some of the um, removal. Um, and I know Mr. Mayo was incredibly responsive to the neighbors in that regard. I would just ask that going forward, if over the next 30 day period, assuming that it gets voted on, if those sorts of issues are flagged to you or to anyone, if someone could reach out to Town Hall immediately, I think that would, be, would go a long way to, to allay some of the neighbor concerns. And I get that. You know, when right. you're, Absolutely. Yeah. Just like next to a construction right. site or whatever the case is, I get that. So, you know, and, and again, Mr. Uh, I think Mr. Mayor was incredibly responsive and very quick, um, but just a little more advanced notice on that sort of thing I think would be helpful for us. What was what was that issue? I didn't know about that issue because I've been on the site every day that a load has been taken off and I didn't, and, I, and I'm there till the end and I leave. I saw no glass or no debris. We're very careful about that. So the, There were concerns, there, there was, um, the reporting of, of, of broken glass that had been on Water Street in both directions, out, outside of the, off the property. I, I, would, I would dispute that that came from our site. I really would, because I, I, in there, I have every day that a load, every time that a load has been taken off of that property, I've been there personally, every day. So, and I'm the last one to leave. So I check it and I don't, I don't, I have never seen, I look at it for that purpose. So I just want to bring up that point that, you know, I think we've been extremely respectful in the way that we've gone about this. Um, and, and, and to the neighbors, you know, that I guess, you know, they haven't bothered us either. So, you know, they, they've been fine. You know, they, it's not like there's been no, no actions that have been impending our progress or getting in our way and we're grateful for that. But we've been, you know, I just want to say we've been, we've tried to be very respectful. We we look at the property and outside the property when we leave. So I, I that's why I just had to make that point. I dispute whether that came from our site. Maybe it's something else. Okay. But you. we will in the future watch it yep. um, mm -hmm. to make sure. I, I think that that's all. Done. I think that's all we ask. Yeah. Yeah. I think we need to belabor it. Um, so if there's no more discussion, 
I'll have a motion to, I'm not sure it actually is quite 30 days, so let's just say until our meeting on like April 25th. We have a motion. Still moved. Second. Okay. Any additional discussion? All in favor of extending until April 25th? 7 0. I, I didn't exactly Thank say what the, the order is. The order until the 25th. You're That's good. Fine. We know what it is. Yeah, we know what it is. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Thank Thank you, Brian. Thank you Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Um, item seven is donations, and I think Steve, you were going to clarify right, what and this, this is. Right, um, this is actually a little bit connected uh, to the site. So um, we do have six thousand dollars in donations. Uh, the uh, donors wish to be anonymous, and this is to defray any town costs involved in the um, cleanup of the 383 Water Street site. Um, very okay. grateful to live in such a wonderful community with mm -hmm. business and. Uh, Others that want to help very out, generous, so very would, would like the the uh, council to accept that if they don't find. That's great. And a motion to accept six thousand dollars. So moved. Seconded. Okay. Any dis discussion on a motion to accept six thousand yeah, dollars? Um, for the cleanup towards three eighty three anonymous. Thank you. No. Okay. All in favor? Opposed? And I have to Seven say zero. thank you. Mr. McGrail is there every day because he talks to me every day and sends me <laughs> pictures every day. And I've been out there many days. Um, and he actually does have his gloves on, is actually throwing things in dumpsters at the same time. So uh, he has gone <laughs> above and beyond. <laughs> it's nice to see progress yeah. there for everybody involved. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you. Okay, item number eight. Fiscal year 2023 budgets and finance committee subcommittee recommendations. The two budgets we're talking about tonight are really courtesy budgets from this. Uh, no, actually, the vote you vote on. Oh, the vote yeah. we do vote yes. on. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. So the um, the first being the Northeast Vocational School. I don't know. Um, I think we have a number of representatives from the vocational school here. Yes. And while you're doing that. On and Jay should be coming over. Okay. Madam Chair, while you're doing that, I'm yep. going to pinch it for Kevin. And I have my binder. I know Maureen likes that when I have my <laughs> binder. Without any idea. Um, you need it if you're pinch hitting for Kevin. I do. <laughs> I do. Right. That That's so, a thousand pages. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Um, so the fiscal year 23 vocational school budget, and I think that the town council needs to remember that, mm -hmm. while the Northeast Regional Metropolitan Vocational School will talk about their budgets, we do have some children that go to other schools, other vocational schools. So uh, when you do make the motion, uh, we'd be looking for $2,163,315. And of that is included in the vocational school up at the hill, we'll talk about that. Um, we are not having any children this year at the Minuteman Regional School because the only one that we had last year uh, graduated, so we don't know of any others. Um, at the Ethic, at the Essex North Shore School, we will have um, some children as we had eight students in there last year, one graduated, so we budgeted for seven students for fiscal year 23. Um, only seven students were budgeted in fiscal year 22 and eight attended. Um, so we really never know mm -hmm. until right. we get the bill in October on these other schools. So I think that um, it really is, is a great budget and I know the vote will go through theirs, but um, I did want to let you know that the, when I do ask for the motion, it'll be a little different than what the Northeast will do. Okay. Okay. Council Chines? Can I uh, just ask a question through you, Madam Chair, before we get to the, uh, the Northeast section of it. Uh, the transportation um, cost reduction, is that related to? That is related to, I can always count on you, Jonathan. That is, that is related to um, Minuteman. Okay. So if we don't have anybody going, we don't have the transportation. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Welcome. Um, if you could just introduce yourself and share the Northeast Vocational School budget. I, I'll go well, Jace. Coming on. Yeah. I'm Carla Scozzarella. I'm the principal uh, deputy director up the hill at the Voc School. And this is our director of finance, Jay Pacone. Mm -hmm. And as usual, he'll be providing you with the budget information. Thank you. Excellent. Is Brittany Carousel available? Is she on? She's our representative from Wakefield. Yeah, I do see Brittany. All right. 
I didn't know if she wanted to say a few words before I started or. Yeah, she is. Okay. <clears throat> We may not be able to see everybody who's on screen, so Sherry, if... Right. Okay. So if she's on, she can proceed or we can wait. She is on, yeah. Okay, yes, please proceed. Hi, Brittany. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi. Sorry about that. All right. Did you want me to proceed, Brittany, or did you want to say a few sure. words? That'd be okay. great. All right. Um, Sherry, is there any way I could share my screen? You should be able to, Jay, yeah. Excellent. All right. Okay. Great. Everybody can see that, correct? Yes. All right. Excellent. All right. So thank you very much, everyone, for having us tonight. This is the presentation of the FY23 budget for Northeast Metro Tech. The goal of our FY23 budget, and really the goal of all of our budgets that we set out to produce on an annual basis is we always have two goals in mind. Um, first and foremost, we always want to minimize the financial impact to our member communities. You know, we understand that our, our member communities have certain financial constraints. They're under the prefaces of Prop 2 and a half, or how much money they can raise via taxation on an annual basis. Uh, we also understand that there's uh, other departments that you need to fund fully and adequately. And uh, we don't want to hamper the district um, with a, a large assessment increase, um, you know, because we understand that you know, Wakefield is we Wakefield is a, a partner with us in this endeavor, uh, and we don't want to um, financially burden them. And secondly, we want to provide an adequate level of funding to su support student learning and, and foster educational excellence, because ultimately that's what we're here to do. We're here to be Wakefield's other school. We want um, the community of Wakefield to be proud to send their kids to Northeast, even though we're right up the hill from you guys. Um, but we really do consider ourselves the other school we want to be as excellent as the Wakefield Public Schools, uh, except uh, in a vocational pathway. And... Um, we really take that to heart. And thirdly, there's a third goal in this budget. We want to allocate the additional funds um, that were provided for by the Student Opportunity Act to best meet student needs. So regionalization exists by definition to offer services at a reduced cost to its member communities. So <clears throat> our initial budget goal every single year we, we set out to produce is uh, we want to keep it at a below a 3% increase. Uh, which would be 463,977 or less. I will say that we were able to accomplish that this year. Um, this year is a little bit different because this is the first year that we have our debt service uh, payment, um, the principal and interest for the first year of the bonding for our school building projects, which thankfully, um, and, and thanks in a large part to Wakefield uh, due to your support, um, it passed with 83% of the, of, of the vote, of the popular vote. So um, the school building project um, moves on, onward and upward. So, But um, the actual operation assessment increase before the debt assessment is 136,448, and equates to about a 0.88% increase of assessment. So the next slide shows a historical uh, assessment analysis. Um, Shows in FY21, we went up 288,463. FY22, we went up 450,186. And FY23, we went up 136,448. Again, this is before the debt service payment. The debt service payment obviously inflates that number, but um, it's, a, it's a required increase. Um, we've been talking about it for six years. Um, and, you know, this is, was a known cost that was coming. So uh, I think we did, we, we did a pretty good job informing the communities over the years um, that this was uh, that this was coming and over the year we actually um, uh, solidified the numbers so therefore um, we, we came in pretty close to uh, to the estimate uh, the only thing that would be different was the October 1 numbers that we had to adjust um, the assessments for 
And this is a numerical representation of that same data. You can see that we went up 0.88% in FY23. So the, the real reason why we were able to, um, to minimize this member community assessment is because we got a, a big influx of Chapter 70 money um, due to the Student Opportunity Act. Initially, it was supposed to be rolled out in um, FY21. Uh, however, that was pre-COVID, and then when revenue uh, dried up, and that that was not possible. So um, they actually revised the, the, the Chapter 70 numbers, FY21, uh, and we had to actually cut the budget by $780,000 mid-year. But we were able to um, we were able to do that with some creative financing. Uh, in FY22, we got a little bit of a, a bump of, of Chapter 70, but in FY23, we really see a, an increase of um, what they promised, right-sizing the uh, the Chapter 70 formula to a um, to where it really should be. Um, this is a seven-year program that they're going to roll this out in. Um, so this is. Um, if, if this is a sign of what's to come, it's, it's a good sign. So as I mentioned, we received the 12,768,498 in aid in FY23. And why that's significant is it's 1,573,385 higher than our budgeted aid in FY22. And we use all of that to offset uh, the member community's assessments. Um, we intend to receive a projected million dollars of transportation revenue that we're gonna receive in uh, FY22, which we're receiving right now. We're gonna bank those receipts and use that to offset the FY23 budget. Um, and additionally, we're gonna use 2,279,950 from our E&D or excess and deficiency funds to further reduce the assessment costs. In total, we plan to use 3,279,950 of other funds to reduce the number of assessments. So FY23 is, uh, has Following fiscal challenges, like any other year, uh, we need funding for regular contractual salary obligations, including steps and lanes, funding for new educators based on student needs and increased enrollment in key subjects, funding for our OPEB liability, which is in, uh, around $60 million liability for any, anybody who doesn't know who, what OPEB is, I'm sure you do, but um, as other post-employment benefits, it's a uh, future liability of all of our um, if any, everybody was to retire all at once, that would be the, uh, the, the future cost of all benefits uh, related to those re retirees. Um, funding increases for health insurance costs due to a projected 6.3% increase in GIC premiums and funding to tackle overcrowding in this current school building due to uh, increased enrollments. Um, and by that, we, we're looking to get another um, modular classroom because we're exploding right now. I mean, our, our enrollment is, um, is far exceeding our capacity. So in total, um, Northeast, uh, our total um, operating expense before debt service was projected to be 31,650,800, uh, which is 5.99% or 1,789,784 over FY22's operating budget. But as I mentioned, we're using a lot of um, reserves in, in um, increased revenues to offset that $1,789,000. Um, we offset that by an additional $1,653,000. Uh, and that brings us to one, I can't really see past this little box here, yeah, $136,448 um, is the total assessment increase before debt service. So after the application of debt service um, of 1,862,200, 1, um, the total assessment increase for all communities is going up 12.23%. Um, I'm sorry, I take that back. That, that's what the operating budget costs going up. The total, um, the assessment, uh, resulting assessment is 12.92% because the 136,448, we have to add the 1,862,200 onto it. Um, as I mentioned, we've, we've been talking about this and, and a lot of communities have been planning, I know Wakefield has been planning for this for a number of years. So um, this is the resulting uh, assessment increase. And in Wakefield, you'll see that you went up six students um, based on that plus the, um, the capital assessment, uh, the increase is uh, 284,836. 
uh, the total assessment is 2,017,068. And that is that is it. And if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Great. Thank you. Any questions Welcome. from the councillors? Councillor Chines? Uh, thank you and, and thank you, Jay, for the uh, the presentation. Just a, a couple of questions. Um, in terms of the use of the 2.3 million from excess and deficiency funds, uh, could you mm -hmm. speak a little bit to sort of uh, you know the the state of your your E&D funds and and what's sort of left after that that allocation? Sure. Yeah. Um, so we anticipated that we were going to um, we, in FY21. That's based. That's where the E&D funds are derived. We had uh, some savings left over, so we we actually made a plan to build up our E&D funds. In order to, because we wanted to pass along that savings to the member communities. Um, for instance, we had savings in transportation. Uh, we had savings in other areas that we didn't uh, fully expend, and we said, you know, we're going to build up our E and D, and be able to use that um, that total um, increase to really uh, significantly impact the member community assessments, um, because we thought that would be the most fiscally responsible thing to be, to do. Um, in terms of our E and D, we're fully will be at fully at the 5% okay. of, um, of allowable uh, carryover in terms of the uh, balances. OK, it, yeah, after the 2.3 million that, yes. great. Yep. OK. Uh, it, and just a second question. Um, it, can you remind me of this? And I, I'm sure we went through this when we uh, we talked about the facility project. Uh, the debt service of 1.8 million, uh, I'm assuming that increases in uh, in fiscal 24 as, as the building kind of comes online and construction's underway? In fiscal 24, it's pretty similar, and, if, and it's not until fiscal 25 is okay. when it, it starts to creep up. Okay, and can you remind us roughly what, what you were expecting in, in 25 and after, if you, if you know off the top uh, of your head? 25. Um, what, I, I don't have it right in front of me, but I can certainly get you that information. No worries. Uh, I, 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 could, I could, I'm sure I could go back and figure it out as well. But yeah, no, I'd be happy to send it to the committee. That's, that's fine. Um, I can send you the entire, um, exhibit that we have that actually has been updated with all of the new, um, uh, October one numbers. So oh, it would be the most recent data. Great. Thank you very much. I'd be Appreciate happy to it. Share that. You're welcome. Any other questions from the councillors? Steve, did you have anything you want to I, I add? I wanted to, to, to maybe jump on what uh, uh, Jonathan was saying, that when we have our forecast going forward, mm -hmm. we're, we're anticipating you know, a little bit of an increase in 24, a little bit in 25. 26, we're really seeing the big jump. You know, Usually right. you're paying those in arrears. So we, we've got that all in, right. in going forwards. So can I ask a question because it, the school we know has been approved, which is great, but it's not fully designed yet. So we don't really have the, I mean, do we have a fixed cost? Because my understanding is there's still a lot of design considerations to be considered. Yeah, our budget has been locked in. So we can't, we can't, we can only spend 300, 317 million is the total amount that we could, we can spend. And okay. it can't go. Right. So you're designing that. within that, um, the, within that box, within that number. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Okay. Yep. Thank you. And that, you does, it, that does include some yeah. contingencies too. So there's right. some of that is built into the 317 million. Okay. And that's locked in with SBA. Mm -hmm. that's, right. Yeah. I know that's yes. locked in with SBA. Yeah. <clears throat> Councilor uh, Dabrowski. Actually, I had a chance this weekend to speak to a mom of a, of a current student. And it she was glowing about the school. Um, she was talking about you know, the, the various you know, um, disciplines that he has now been exploring before you narrow, narrow down what it is you want to go forward in. And um, he has been doing so incredibly well. Um, and she like, was just glowing because it, it, you can tell she felt like he had a great future ahead of him. Um, and he does. And I think any student that goes to this school has a great future ahead of them. So I'm in full support of, of looking at ways that we can really you know, um, take advantage of this great asset that we have. It mm -hmm. happen, happens to be in our town, um, but a great asset for our students. And you know, this idea of thinking about individualized learning and what what makes sense for each student and playing up, you know, um, upon their strengths and making sure we're we're promoting them. So it's not just like a, a shuffling through, but instead, 
you know, how can we individualize each each educational experience, you know, to help everyone re realize their potential. And I mean, I, I, she was almost brought to tears when she was speaking so pridefully about, you know, all that that her son was doing. So, I would just say, just please continue to do what you're doing, um, mm -hmm. because programmatically, it, it it's making an impact on, on a lot of kids' lives. Thank you. That's nice to hear. Mm -hmm. That explains your large enrollment, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and growing enrollment. Just and growing enrollment. Okay, um, so uh, we have a motion for, we need a motion for $2,163,315 for the vocational budget, which includes Northeast Regional as well as Minuteman and Essex and transportation costs. So moved. Second. It's so moved by Councillor Butt and seconded by Councillor Santos. Any additional discussion? Seeing none. All in favor of the vocational school budget? All okay. opposed? Uh, so 7 0. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great, thanks for the presentation. Much. Thank you very much for having us. All right. Okay. So we do not have to vote on the Wakefield budget. Oh, maybe not. Um, do you want to do an overview? Uh, no, I think that you can okay. just go right to the superintendent, who I think they'll be bringing okay. up. Okay, so they're bringing. Yeah. Yep, Greg should be coming Lions up. Right is now. coming up. Madam Chair, while we're waiting, do yes. we want to go back to public engagement at some point? Well, did um, did Mr. Connolly show up, um, Sherry, for public engagement? Yes. Yeah. We can we can take. It, it, I think we can take him. He's chair prerogative. Doug, we're just going to put you on hold for a couple, couple more minutes. No more than three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes max. And you're welcome to stay on camera. Thank you, Councillor Chines. I didn't realize. Hello. Hello. Hi, this is Bill. Hi, Bill. How are you? If you just want to introduce yourself, um, and we'll give you three uh, minutes to share your thoughts. Yes, and I'll explain my uh, my lateness a bit, but we'll move quickly on. Bill Conley, uh, 83 Elm Street, uh, board member of the Friends of Lake Quantipowit. Uh Thank you very much for your consideration, letting letting me in. I did get here a little late. I'm in Denver, and I don't know if it's the time or the elevation, but <laughs> something happened. So that's my excuse. Very gracious of you to let me in. I would like to uh, say that I'm speaking on behalf of the Friends of Lake Quantipowit and our president, Margaret Cope. She has a letter en route to the town council. The subject being the structure policy for the lake. I know that's coming up. Uh, on the agenda tonight. And uh, I'd like to, if I could, just read a bit of it. I won't read the whole letter, but I think it'll get uh, what we are thinking relative to uh, this particular uh, request. So bear with me, I'll bring up, uh, I think I will bring up, if I can shrink my screen. Yeah, so this is the letter from uh, Margaret. I, I'll just read it, I won't share it at a time, but uh, it is addressed to the town council dated today, and it's under her signature. And she says, dear members of the town council, the board of directors of the Friends of Lake Quantipawa urges the town council to adhere to its policy titled structures placed adjacent to Lake Quantipawa in Veterans Memorial Park and public playgrounds, not schools, and to deny the request of Sentinel Benefits and Financial Group located at 100 Quantipowit Parkway to erect a little library kiosk as a memorial to a deceased employee on, on public land. While well, coming from absolutely worthy sentiments, as we all understand, it is an example of why the policy was put in place. Fellow FOLQ has learned through its own experience that the immense demand for memorials around the lake threatened the integrity of the limited square footage of grassy area around the lake. Every new memorial is an invitation for more. It will never end, and the memorials once installed are extremely difficult to remove. Uh, 
the relevant section is quite uh, of the policy which folq participated in the forming of it and we're very pleased about it to give the town uh, council something to work with recognizing i think in general that there were limits uh, necessary uh, she goes on to say that requests of this nature uh, are to be accompanied uh, by uh, a, a written plan, written uh, notice to the town administrator's office of plans and specifications, exactly what's going on. And the, the policy calls for, you know, clear opportunity for the public to be involved in this. So it's very, very positive. Uh, we just feel unequivocally that uh, requests of this nature are to be excluded, citing the policy, are in the best interest of the public use of public land uh, and not uh, seeding something in the way of an ability to add structure or mend a structure uh, to private commercial businesses. So that's the thoughts of the Friends of Lake Quantapowit. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Counselors, uh, thank you. You can expect a letter from Margaret to the effect. I don't want to take up too too much time, but we are very committed uh, to uh, looking at this, and hopefully uh, the request will not uh, not be honored in, in any way. Thank you, thank very, you very, very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Connolly. We thank will you. we will look for that, and we're going to be discussing that later in the in the meeting today. Thank you, and thank to the you, FLQ Council. for your. And Sherry for spotting me out here. So. <laughs> <laughs> and for Jonathan for alerting me that you were there. Okay. Thank you, all. Thank you very Thank much. You Have all. fun in Denver. Uh, yes, we will. <laughs> bye bye. Okay, Mr. Lyons, the floor is yours. Introduce yourselves and Thank um, you very much. walk us through this. Sure. Thank you very much for having us this evening. Ryan, can you put up the slide deck? Thank you so much. Can everybody see that? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Um, so this is an abbreviated deck. Um, this is a reduced by about two thirds, just to try to be concise and give you a, a quick overview of our budget. Next slide, please, Ryan. The goal for this evening is to just share budget priorities that align with our district and instructional strategy, um, give you a snapshot of how we have surveyed and included uh, the community to help us prioritize um, budget resources and to explain budget priorities and how that correlates to the proposed increases that we made to school committee that was accepted last week. There'll be time at the end also for, of course, question, questions and answers. Next slide, please, Ryan. So the, the budget priorities um, for the FY23 budget is, th there are many. Um, it, they are, we're looking at really trying to, you know, get the Wakefield Public Schools back on track and get us focused, you know, back on, on kind of a, a focus on academic um, teaching and learning, um, social emotional support for students. Uh, but we're also looking at the gaps that have been caused due to the pandemic. We're looking for uh, opportunities to accelerate students that are prepared to be accelerated um, at elementary, middle and high school. We're looking at kind of the social emotional needs and the counseling needs of students. I'm sure you've all seen in the media how difficult it is to, to get a clinician, uh, find a clinician. And so we are, last year we had two grant funded adjustment counselors um, and we're seeking to move those from a grant funded positions um, to the regular budget. And so we're also looking at two additional science teachers that were contractual commitments that we made three years ago when we settled the teacher contract and we delayed the hiring of those positions due to COVID. We're also looking at special education needs um, and programs for improved transition services and as well as additional staffing in that area. Next slide, please, Ryan. So at the high school, we're looking, um, this has been something that has been a priority for us for a few years now, but it, due to COVID, it has been kind of flat. And so we are looking at getting back on track to provide dual enrollment opportunities and student internships. And so dual enrollment really has kind of two parts to it. One is really focusing on first generation college applicants 
The other is providing college experiences for students at the high school level. So that's something that we're gonna be focusing on this coming year, as well as student internships. The more we feel like we can get students in positions in areas of high interest um, that they're interested in learning about and possibly going into um, and through their major in college and, and then maybe work after, the more they can really be thoughtful about um, the courses and majors that they're taking. Um, a, big, a big issue for us is, and it is with all school districts and municipalities, is just this notion of recruiting and retaining um, teachers, administrators, as well as paraeducators para during this time. And so, you know, it's a difficult time to, to find and hire exceptional people. You know, the, the human resource market has been affected by COVID in dramatic ways, and not only um, in predictable sectors like technology um, in other areas, but also on the school side as well. <clears throat> Excuse me, an additional priority for us is to uh, retain um, through grant funding, uh, the two custodians that we took on this past year, which were grant funded, um, and our two float nurses. Uh, we, we believe that we are gonna continue to have um, health needs that we're gonna need our nurses. And we've also made commitments in regard to maintenance and facilities work that these two custodians will help us with this coming year. And so, which brings me to my next bullet, which is uh, to continue to, to work collaboratively with DPW um, on the preventative maintenance and, and improvements that we've made to facilities. You know, we've invested quite a bit of money in a short amount of time due to COVID in our HVAC systems and facilities. And to keep up what we have kind of put into those systems is gonna take time and effort. And we're really fortunate to have uh, the relationship that we do have with DPW. And, and we're looking that, we're thinking that we will be able to do that in a very positive way. And so the last bullet is just a, a reminder that the Wakefield Public Schools, uh, I know we have the largest budget in town, we're reminded frequently, and, but we also wanna be clear that it, it is a budget that funds a faculty and staff of 594 students in seven bargaining units, serving close to 3,400 students and families in, in pre-K uh, through post, right? That's students up to age 22. Next slide, please. Christine. Sure, good evening, everyone. Um, this slide just highlights the change from fiscal 22 to 23, and it's broken down by the three categories. Um, these three categories we report monthly to school committee. It's personnel, all staff on the payroll of Wakefield Public Schools, um, and then contractual services, things like busing, um, services <laughs> students, um, out of district placements, and again, um, materials and supplies. So it shows our, our three big buckets of, of spending. And of course, our largest bucket is personnel. But from 22 to 23, our increase for 23 is 4.99% over 22 um, for 47 million six oh seven zero seven seven. Next slide, please. So basically, we also wanted to address what the COVID-related costs that we're still paying for in 22. We're still paying for the two additional ad adjustment counselors to help our students adjust back to, to um, in-person learning. Um, it's been a long two years, and some of our students, this is really their first year back in in-person learning full-time. Um, we're doing additional testing and assessment services for those students to really find out where they're, where they're at and uh, what services they might require. We've hired this year four COVID teaching positions. While we were in quarantines and, and um, we were having our spikes, we had COVID teachers who were supporting our students um, who were in quarantine. We are um, currently still have the two additional custodians and the two additional float nurses that move from school to school. They have been such value added to our families. And then we provided um, testing clinics for our staff when we were in the height of, um, when we seen the surge in, the, in town, we, we provided along with the town, some testing clinics to the tune of $35,000. So to date, we've spent almost $700,000 um, in COVID related costs in fiscal 22. We were lucky to offset um, most, well, half of it with ESSER two funds. And um, we're 
anticipating some uh, funds this year from the town for about $360,000. Next slide. So we know we're still gonna have some COVID related costs in fiscal 23. Our two float nurses are supporting, we're doing um, at home testing with our families and staff. They test at home and let us know if there's any positive um, tests, but they report to those nurses who can um, also communicate to the schools and to our faculty. We have two custodians. We've done such incredible improvements to our facilities over the past two years in conjunction with DPW and the town, but it, that, um, those improvements come at a cost. We have um, filter changes that happen quite often during the year. Um, we have storage facilities that are um, still having to be unpacked and sorted through for some of our furniture when we had to socially distance in the classrooms. So all of these costs for next year are still looking at $323,000. And we're hoping to offset that with the ARPA money coming from the town for next year. Next slide. So we have one more ESSER three from the state that's coming and we are able to spend that over 23 and 24. So we, we made a conscious decision when we did our um, survey to the community about what we we're gonna put on that grant. We heard very loud and clear from our families. They wanted individualized instruction for students. After school and summer tutoring, we need to provide mental health services and supports for our families and our students. And we still need to maintain improvements in air quality in our school facilities. So what we've done is we've, we've um, targeted these four areas in our ESSER three, but we're gonna spend it thoughtfully over 23 and 24. So we're not gonna spend it all in 23 and have a funding cliff in 24. We're being really thoughtful about that. Next slide. And then um, we talked about, um, Doug and I, when we were um, talking to school committee, there are things when we're putting this budget together, we've been working on this budget since November and there are things that we've known and there's still things we don't know. But we know that we heard from, um, we had um, staff forums with all of our teachers, all of our principals, all of our administrators, <laughs> and we heard that direct instruction and intervention and counseling are the top priorities for next year. We heard, particularly the elementary, that extended day for intervention services were going to be important next year. And our technology supports are critical to maintain the investments that we made in all of our um, devices for our students. We also made an investment in a new student management system for next year, it's PowerSchool. Um, IPASS, our current system really has um, out, you know, it, it's not really supporting the, our needs. So we made an investment for PowerSchool. What we do know, we just heard that meals will no longer be free to all of our students next year, which I know is really disappointing for some of our families. Um, but we still have some unknowns. As Doug just mentioned, human resources is really a challenge. Filling some of our paraprofessional roles, crossing guides, um, some of our teacher roles. We are really seeing um, shortages in people working in the educational field. Um, so that's sort of um, a struggle that some of our principals are really, we're trying to target now for next year. For food services, we're really seeing some supply chain issues for goods and services. Um, those are affecting our, our mail costs. And we've talked about um, the special education stabilization fund, which we know we had to access once during COVID. Right now we don't anticipate having to go to the, the stabilization fund again. But um, you know, out of district costs is something that we're always keeping an eye on. I don't know, Doug, if you wanted to weigh in. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I think it's important for the, the, the council to hear that, that we're paying very close attention uh, to the economy and what's happening around the United States, but also around the world. You know, we, we're, we're, we are affected by, you know, supply chain issues. We are affected by personnel. Uh, we used to post positions and get um, quite a few applicants and we're, we're seeing um, applicant pools really kind of drying up for certain positions that are really requiring us to be creative and thoughtful about, you know, how we're developing talent from within um, and so, you know, if, if, if not plan A, then what's plan B? So we're not deterred at, at really trying to continue to improve the school system. We really just want to acknowledge that these things that are difficult um, across the state and for all school districts and all municipalities 
are things that we are that we are working through as well. And so I, I can take the next slide as well. Next slide, please, Rack. So I, you know, Christine mentioned ESSER. So we between our ESSER survey and our annual budget survey that we that we administered this year, we had close to fourteen hundred um, replies. And so the personnel that that had access to that survey were students, parents, teachers, faculty, and staff. And so that's very important in helping us to prioritize um, our resources. And so this is just one snapshot. We had probably 15 slides capturing our survey information, but I, I just wanted to include one slide this evening so that you could see. So you'll see in the first row, um, those are the top priorities in the first row going horizontally from left to right. But I also listed kind of our second tier priorities because we wanna to continue to keep an eye on those and, and just be thoughtful about how we're planning, not just for this budget, not just for FY23, but for FY24, 25, and 26 as well. You know, Christine mentioned, you know, negotiating a funding cliff. We're really trying to be thoughtful about how we're creating a bridge with our grant money so that if we need something, even personnel over time, that we're moving it from the grant funded position to our regular budget. And we're trying to do that incrementally so it doesn't create this kind of big uh, spike in, in, our, in our budgeting. Um, but I just wanted to mention that. I think it's important to know. Next slide, please. So you've heard us say this. So the priorities for us in regard to to um, in, our, in our proposal that we made to school committee. Um, we have two additional science specialists at the elementary level. You know, th there's no mystery here, right? If we wanna have exceptional science programs at middle and high school, we need to start early. Our science programming at elementary um, was, was good, but not as good as it could have been. We worked collaboratively with the teachers and agreed in our last round of negotiations that we would hire science specialists to support the teaching of science at the elementary level in grades K through four. We agreed that we would do this over a two year period, funding two positions in one year and two positions in the following year. We delayed that due to COVID, uh, but now we're in kind of year, year two or year three, which should have been year two. We're looking to fund two positions in science. We're also looking to move from a grant funding to the regular budget, the two adjustment counselors that we hired last year. We hired one, at the middle school and one at the high school. Um, and they have certainly um, really been game changers for us in those spaces in regard to their ability to support students and families during this period. Uh, we're looking at one additional paraprofessional at Doyle uh, for a new student that's coming in who needs specific support. And we're looking at four special education positions district-wide in, in response to program shifts as students are moving from elementary to middle. Um, and also we need additional support um, really at, at pre-K, elementary, and middle is where, is where all four of these positions are going. Um, next slide, please. So Christine mentioned this. Uh, we're looking at, at two custodians um, to be grant funded this year, as well as our two float nurses. And so I feel like we've, we've provided a lot of information there. Um, I think we can move to the next slide. Christine, you want to take this? Sure. We just thought we'd highlight the, um, I know the, the vocational school already talked about the Student Opportunity Act, but we, we've seen some increased funding for Chapter 70. Now we know the governor's budget isn't the final budget. It's the, the first one that comes out. It helps um, municipalities start budget planning. But for us in Wakefield, you know, we're seeing over a 14% increase in Chapter 70. So we just wanted the slide to sort of highlight mm -hmm. the additional funding that's coming into Wakefield. So we thought that was good news. Next slide. So that's really a summary of, we had um, many more slides for school committee and a budget book that's 64 pages. So if anyone wants some nighttime reading, it's on our website. I can print out a, a, a book for you as well. But um, we sort of highlighted um, everything that we've been talking about. I feel like Doug for the past four months um, really stressing that this budget is really thoughtful. It's really inclusive of all um, our staff, our students, 
um, our principals, um, just our administrators. There's, you know, it's not just Doug and I sitting in a room and, and coming up with this budget. It's really been, you know, months of planning. But I think we just um, will pause there for some questions. Councilor Santos, um, not re not really a question. I just want to um, thank you for such a, a thoughtful budget. I've been on the council long enough that I remember way back when the budgets were presented. Um, they weren't presented arrogantly, but the lack of information in the budgets <laughs> made it really hard to get a grip on um, what was happening at the schools, and that has absolutely never been the case with you, Doug. So I want to thank you so much for such a detailed budget, and I can, and Christine as well, and I can, um, you know, your issue with retention and hiring, it, it's hitting every, it's hitting all kinds of um, um, jobs and, and professions at the, in a uh, university level where I am, we cannot hire, we cannot retain, we're losing people, we're having such a hard time hiring good people. So I absolutely feel your pain, but um, appreciate, um, you know, trying to hire the best we can. So thank you for this budget. It's very helpful. Thank you. Councilor Chang. No, I, I want to echo, uh, you know, Councilor Santos's comments. I, I think this is the sixth public school budget that I've gone through between serving on finance committee and town council. and. I, I am continually impressed at the job that you do to engage with members of the community. I, I say that as a, as a parent. Um, I, I know that engagement also sits with, with students and faculty. Um, and, and the fact that you put together a budget that is both responsible in the current year, but also uh, one that looks forward to our needs in future years. Uh, and, and one that responds to sort of the, the, the hallmark of what we're trying to do as a, as a school system in terms of individualized student-focused education. So uh, really, once again, just kind of an excellent job uh, with all of this and uh, appreciate not only you two, but I, I know there's a lot of work behind the scenes as well uh, and a lot of work on the school committee side too uh, to go through it. I just ha I had a couple of sort of specific questions that I wanted to talk through and, and maybe just uh, the first one, if if I could ask on the... The, the two custodians and the two float nurse positions. So it sounds yes. like the expectation is that those would be sort of one-year positions that would sunset for fiscal 2024, obviously assuming that things kind of progress the way we hope they progress in terms of the pandemic. Um, can you talk about any uh, additional work that those positions have carried on that you would expect to carry forward and how you'd anticipate that kind of playing out in future years? Sure. Uh, first of all, on the custodians, um, you know, the kind of we've created different not only cleaning schedules, but also maintenance schedules, Jonathan. So, you know, maintenance that we used to do once a year, we're now doing twice a year. So, for example, we, we change filters um, and HVAC systems, right, throughout the entire school department, right? And so um, you're talking hundreds of unit events. Yeah. Um, that need to be, you know, taken apart, filters changed, put back together. Um, you know, filters are, are just one example. We've also brought on individual air filtration units, right? We've, we have, I think, almost a thousand air filtration units that are um, that are distributed throughout all of our schools and classrooms, right? Those are units that we brought on um, because of COVID. And so between preventative maintenance and schedules that have changed between additional equipment that has been brought in and kind of the changes in the way that we're cleaning, I, I think that those positions, you know, we have two positions. We probably could use four, but we're really just trying to be thoughtful and make it work um, the best we can with the personnel that we have. We also, I will, I will say, I can't um, say enough about DPW and how um, Joe Conway and his group, uh, Chris Pierce, have been really remarkable in being proactive um, with with all of our systems. You know, you know, we have items listed on capital and tier one, tier two, tier three. You know, if something looks like it's going to fail. Um, you know, I think in, in when I first arrived here, I think we would wait. To be honest with you, Jonathan, I think yeah. we would wait. Now I feel like, you know. Um, we're far more proactive than we were just a few years ago. So because of all those reasons, for example, so that's custodians and facilities. In regard to our nurses, um, the level of communication and support that our nurses provide 
students and families is different now. Um, their, their job is different. Their uh, communication cycles that they're in, you know, they're working um, well beyond the school day, mm -hmm. you know, answering email from families that just want to check in about, they're continuing to check in about uh, COVID exposures, isolation, uh, quarantine, how do you make it work? You know, should I send my child to school? They, they are also key players in the testing and management of information for 2,200, 2200 people, 20, close to maybe 22 or 2,400 people. What's the, what's the number, Christine? Yeah, but it's about 2,400 people who have who opted in for at-home testing. Yeah. Plus, the, the nurses help facilitate. We are distributing tests every other week to family and staff and making sure that they have them. So every Monday, <laughs> Um, students can test before they come to school, uh, mm -hmm. faculty can test, and we can make sure that we are reporting that and we're making sure that that information gets to DESE. So the amount of work that has really um, fallen on the nurses has really increased and they have just been remarkable. Yeah, our, our nurses are often the first stop, especially at the elementary level. Um, if students are feeling a little anxious or feeling like they just need to to check in, the nurse's office is usually the first stop. So, you know, they're um, often directing traffic, right? Directing students um, to our adjustment counselors, directing students to the administration. So they're they're kind of, um, they're, they've become key players in the daily operation of our schools. So- and, and we were fortunate when we posted for these two positions, we didn't know if we would be able to find anyone. We found two qualified, registered nurses to fill these roles. So we were so fortunate to find them. So we, I hope I answered your question, Jonathan. Well, you know, and, and I, I may not have been uh, as clear with it, but uh, certainly, first of all, I appreciate you recognizing uh, the custodians and the nurses in this. I, I will tell you again, as, as a parent, um, and as a parent who's interacted a lot with, uh, particularly uh, Kelly Qualey at the Walton School with uh, my, uh, my crowd there, um, you know, the, the praise of the work that the nurses and the custodians are doing at all levels really is, is not undeserved. I mean, they, they've done an amazing job always, but particularly over the last couple of years and in difficult circumstances. But I, I guess the question is, the, um, as we look at those, those four positions um, that we're, we're supporting by ARPA, is the expectation that that work will kind of ease up in, in fiscal 2024 or, um, you know, is there work that then has to be redistributed among other staff or do we, is it still an open question as to whether we would need to, to keep those positions in place? I think at this point, it's still an open question. Okay. You know, um, you know, I, I don't think we are ready to say that we need to move those positions to the regular budget. Um, you know, if we do, we'll need to plan accordingly next year. Um, but I think is if we can continue to fund them through, through grant funds, um, while also keeping our operational budget in a reasonable space, I think that's the way for us to go. Okay, great. No, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, Certainly. I wanted to turn uh, my attention to, uh, for a second around um, literacy coaches. So it, it looked as I went through the budget, and, and I, I sat through the school <laughs> committee meeting and went through the whole budget, so I probably spent more time on this than... Uh, any reasonable person should, but uh, it, it did look like we were, um, there was uh, a removal of, of positions for literacy coaches at the elementary school. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that. I'm not sure if I was looking at that correctly or, you know, given the moving pieces around special education and so forth, if that's kind of accounted for elsewhere. But uh, could you uh, dig into that a little bit? I can. Um, those positions um, were, we presented to school committee about a year ago. Um, and we presented the kind of the reorganization of kind of the curriculum structure. And so we had four literacy coaches. Um, one of those positions um, was reconstituted. One was moved into a kind of a reading specialist position because we had needs in that area. And the two remaining coaches have taken on additional duties. One is a humanities coach and the other is a STEM coach. Uh, but there's been a reorg um, and kind of, I can send you that kind of the distribution of the chart and what that looks like on the curriculum side. But we presented that to school committee a little over a year ago. And, and so um, that has really, really helped us quite a bit um, organize and create considerably more continuity 
and kind of what's happening classroom to classroom and also school to school, especially at the elementary level. Um, but we're also opening up the lens now. It's not just literacy. We're looking at humanities, English, yeah. and, and social studies. And then we're looking at math and, and kind of the STEM fields being cu coupled together so that we're coaching instruction um, across all curricular areas and not just literacy. Great. But you're right. Um, if you go through the pages, you'll see for the Greenwood and the Walton, two um, big um, negative balances because those lines, those were moved from those elementary schools and those two positions that Doug talked about were moved to the district-wide pages. Okay, great. So they're not just assigned to those two schools anymore. Got it, thank you. Uh, and then finally, just the, the last question I, I had, um, you also alluded into the presentation for the fact that the, the federal support for, for free school lunches is ending. Um, and while I, I know that the intent be, uh, behind the school lunch program is that that is self-funding in terms of the cost, I, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that dynamic. I, I'd imagine there's, it, it's, I would guess it's not probably quite self-funded <coughs> given, uh, you know, given just the challenge, challenges of, um, you know, kind of collecting for, for lunches and replenishing student accounts and so forth. But curious about your perspective on what that means for, for you guys going forward. I could chime in, Doug. So um, for the past two years, we've been funded by what's called the Seamless Summer Program. Um, Congress um, was fortunate enough for us to um, fund it. And what it meant was regardless of your ability to pay, every student in school would uh, receive uh, free lunch. So um, the National School Lunch Program, um, I don't know, you, you, as, as a parent, you probably saw the sheet that if you um, have a qualifying income that you would qualify for either reduced lunch rates or free lunch. But during COVID, we saw such a need for, um, for food and food insecurity, which um, Danielle Collins, I don't know if you met her, she's our food service director. She feels so passionately about this. Um, so we were funded that all of our meals were free. Um, they reimbursed all of um, all the food costs. And um, so we were never at on the point of service. We weren't checking on who was on what level of um, free, reduced, yeah. or full pay. But that is not being funded in this um, the package that Congress put together. So it is no longer, it is ending on June 30th. Um, so we, um, for the past um, two summers, we were able to also do um, summer meals. So um, anyone in the community could come on Wednesdays and we were providing um, bags of food, um, fresh produce, and that unfortunately is also ending in June. So we won't be able to do that this summer. But I know our food pantry has also already reached out when they heard this. This was, um, this information was reached, um, reached to all school business administrators and superintendents last week. So I know everyone's sort of rallying the troops right now because just because the funding has stopped, the need has not stopped. Mm -hmm. Um, but I will tell you, our, our school lunches, our participation rates, because it's free, and Lisa's Pizza is fabulous, by the way, our, petition, our um, participation rates doubled. Yeah. The, the lines at lunch were, were um, the, the biggest we've seen in years. So we are just worried about what this is going to mean for some of our families for next school year. Um, but it, that's why it's important. We're already coming up with a plan about how to get the information out to our parents and families this summer and to get those um, information packets back to us about income brackets. So there's some work for us to do, but um, we're just trying to get this word out. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. And uh, again, just really uh, thanks to both of you and, and all of your team, Doug, and, and the school committee for putting this together. I think it's a really thoughtful, responsible budget. Um, you know, one that addresses a lot of challenges and look forward to supporting it at town meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can, uh, sorry, can I just follow up on the school meal? And, and had her hand oh, raised before, but it's no, because um, that what caught my attention too. And I was I was looking it up because I've gotten a lot of emails about the school lunch. There is a statewide bill to get it continued. What the government isn't doing, and Steve, I'm looking to you. I would love for us to send a letter to our delegation with, you know, some specific um, statistics with this the school committee just to say that I think this would be great. 20% of families with children struggle with food insecurity. I don't know if the number is mm -hmm. higher or the same. That's kind of a, a national average. Um, uh, you know, Maine and California do this. I just think it's been so successful and really like well 
fed non-hungry children are the best learners. And so I Absolutely. think if we could, I'm sure our delegation is actually in support of this, mm -hmm. but I think I, I would really appreciate, and I'm happy to work with you, just I think to say that we support this, like Congress is kind of failing us, but maybe our state can pick up a little bit of the slack. So um, that would be our only hope, right? Would be for the state to fund it. Yeah. And, and I, I know Maine, Maine has done it. So we, Maine has. Maine um, and California. Yeah, right. so two right. states two oh. states did it, and I just, um, I, I had heard such great things about the program, people participating, and so that struck me out of the whole, the presentation was great, thank you for all of that, but what struck me is, is, is you know, food insecurity, as you talk about um, supply chain and just the cost of everything going up, if there's anything that we can do to, um, ha you know, help, and take away the stigma, too. I know, mm -hmm. I feel like my first year, Doug, I wrote you about if we did debt collection, because it was a, it was a common story and you told me we did not do that in town and I was um, very proud that we did not do that but I think if we can continue you know helping um, everyone in town I think everyone benefits from it all, all students benefit from it so but thank you for that thank you for your words hi it's good to see you thank you um, I think that this is um, when you're going through the budget, I think it's really clear and really thoughtful approach. And I know that the last two years have been extremely difficult. Uh, but one thing that I really like is your approach of being kind of thoughtful planning, not just for this year, but thinking about long term, both from the budget side of things and also curriculum and looking at, you know, what are we doing in kindergarten and aligning, you know, the vertical curriculum. Um, right up the chain and I think that's really good and you know those changes they take you know those changes can sometimes take years to see um, in terms of, of changes over time mm -hmm. but I think that we are on such a, a steady progression um, with your leadership so thank you for that um, it's I think that it's a it's really nice to see um, so much happening in terms of curriculum so thank you Thank you. Councilor Dombrowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Um, as many of us know, this is the largest budget of the entire uh, cycle that we look at. I'm so surprised you brought that up. And <laughs> also keep in mind, also benefits on top of that. So this is this is not including benefits. So it, it's, it's a significant discussion to be had. And um, I appreciate you, you both for breaking down the amount of detail, because it does matter um, significantly. One question I had about the 700,000, Christine, that you had mentioned um, in COVID-related costs, and you talked about um, ESSER two getting getting us, I think it was 360 or thereabouts. What, where is the difference coming from, or has the difference come from for that? So 360 was, um, a, I don't, at town meeting last year, our budget was cut by $360,000. So the town was going to reimburse us for COVID-related costs for um, that 360. So it was the difference between the school appropriated budget and the town appropriated budget was 360. So that's the difference that um, will be reimbursed by the town. Okay, that's that so was... SR two, SR two ends at in June. Right. So S three will go for the next two years. Right. Okay. Um, and then the other question I, I had related to, I, I know we've, we've focused in, and this council has talked a lot about, about the, um, the social emotional um, supports within the schools, but in speaking with some educators within, within town and some parents, something that really struck me w w um, was equally important, the concern about the uh, learning supports going forward. And one of the reasons, or one of the hypotheses, if you will, that was offered up was that um, there have been some significant attendance issues um, in the schools. And educators especially have found that that has contributed to um, challenges in trying to keep students up to, up to, up to speed, um, trying to um, keep everyone on the same track, if you will, going forward. Can you speak a little bit to, a little bit to that? Do you know how the attendance um, compares I understand obviously COVID has, has thrown things off, but notwithstanding that, my understanding is that a lot of students are not showing up to class as often as they used to. So our daily attendance rates are, are getting back to where they were pre-COVID. So I, I, and I think you're, you're 
well, I think you might be referring to two kind of issues at play. One, one has been a phenomena that we've seen across the state and across the country where um, in some districts, especially in the in urban districts, um, students have pulled out and, and during COVID and did not attend school and they, they had some type of alternative uh, programming, right? And so, so there's, there's that piece, but, but it also has affected um, districts like Wakefield. So we had um, up to 400 students that were participating in, in an all remote schooling during, during COVID, right? And so when that ended at the beginning of this year, we brought those students back. Not all could return. So some students um, have sought alternative settings. So they didn't return to the Wakefield Public Schools. So some of those students are continuing in homeschool programs. Some are continuing in private schools. And some are continuing in um, charter, um, charter virtual schools, which is a phenomenon that has kind of arisen in, during this COVID time. Uh, which is particularly interesting to me. It seems particularly difficult in regard to the oversight of a charter virtual, but I'll, I'll, I'll put that aside. But I, I think that our enrollment um, is getting back to where it was and our daily attendance is getting back to where it was. I don't have specific percentages, but I can provide those for the committee or the council if, if you'd like them. Have any of you been hearing concerns from educators about students not showing up to, to class often enough? So students that are enrolled in the school, um, there's, we take attendance every day. The administration tracks that attendance. And once a student hits a certain number, um, it kind of triggers kind of wraparound supports, right? And so um, are we worried about some students? Yes, always. Are we worried every single year? Yes. Um, but I don't think that this is unique um, or because of COVID. I think it's, you know, any number of reasons where um, some young adults, often at the high school level, um, they sometimes struggle to come to school. And so we are, when, when those situations arise, I think our guidance department, um, our, our high school administration, our middle school administrators, as well as our SROs, school resource officers are particularly vigilant um, about accountability and making sure um, that students are where they belong. The Mass General Law requires a fixed number of days in school per year. Um, the Mass General Law also requires that children attend school. So because of those two things, I, I think we are, we're particularly vigilant in those areas. And then the, the other piece you had mentioned earlier was the, the student um, enrollment opportunities. And I feel like that's, you know, this idea of early college, you know, um, I feel like that's something that we see in other states it, it being incredibly successful. I feel like we've only just scratched the surface here in Massachusetts. Can you speak a little bit to that um, in terms of where we are now and where you see that going over the next few years? Sure. Um, I love this idea. I think, you know, the notion of early college for the two populations that I mentioned in our slide deck, you know, one, one population of uh, first time applicants to college, first generation college applicants, you know, it's particularly important, the success rates of those students in getting into and completing college goes up considerably um, when they have an opportunity to experience college courses early on. And so, but we also have another kind of subset of that group that are just thriving and you know, we should be thinking about what are the possibilities of them taking a college course for credit so that they're leaving high school with a college credit. So in the future, I would love to see students leaving with credits um, that they could transfer. That would be thrilling to me uh, because often now with our advanced placement courses, and I'm sure Ann could speak to this, but often now when students graduate from Wakefield Memorial High School, and they have a number of advanced placement courses that they have completed, a number of colleges won't accept those classes or won't advance them because it affects their business model. Yes. You know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, AP calculus was a big deal. Uh, now, most of our, most of our applicants, um, or it's, it's not uncommon to see that at, at private colleges. And so, so Anne could probably speak more clearly to this than I am right now, Ed. Yeah, you're but, absolutely but, right. 
Yeah, you are. But that's and so in the future, I would love to see that. <laughs> And then I guess finally, um, the we heard from the Vogue, and I think that's just such a great success story. Um, and as they mentioned, you know, they see it as they, they see themselves as one of two schools within Wakefield. Can you talk about um, what the collaboration has been and where you see that collaboration going? Because I think it's a really important opportunity yeah. here. Yeah, um, Dave DeBarry is a colleague. I think you know our relationship has grown considerably, especially during COVID. Um, but I, I feel like experiences for kids to come down the hill or kids to go up the hill are 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 many. You know, I, I think you know we offer a, a culinary course at at Wakefield Memorial High School, one of the few high schools that still has that program, and it's terrific. Um, but to actually for kids that are interested in, in learning more about that, there's no reason why we can't collaborate, for example, in that area. In our TV production space, we have a really unique TV production space um, with two exceptional, exceptional teachers that really bring students in and put them to work. Um, and students do any number of things from writing original materials to producing um, short documentaries and, and kind of video clips that, that they're putting out uh, on social media and in different platforms. So it's a, it's a particularly innovative space, but there's no reason why we can't be kind of collaborating in that area as well. Those are two that just kind of jump out, um, but other areas as well, right? And so as we start to you know look at building a new high school and look at, for example, a STEM lab and think about engineering challenges of the future, right? There's no reason why we couldn't do a joint you know, engineered electric car or something to that effect. Um, you know, but I mean, this is the space that we're moving into, um, which is, you know, Dave, Dave DeBarry's spot on and his team that, that was here tonight, um, Jay and, and Carla, um, they're spot on that the vocational numbers in the next decade are going to be through the roof. And so, you know, we need to kind of look at that and pay attention to it on the public side. And, and I think we have a, a perfect opportunity to do it. And I just see us, I mean, we're talking about two brand new facilities mm -hmm. in the years mm -hmm. to come and trying to leverage those assets. I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars are being invested in this. So how do we collaborate? Mm -hmm. How do we, you know, really have this so that we, we get the most, you know, opportunity for our students? I think it's so, so important. Thank you for answering the questions. Certainly. And I just want to say one other thing is that about, um, you know, when we think about collaboration between the schools and the town is that I really do believe that if we want, we talk about downtown and, you know, revitalization and create an active community of um, vibrant merchants and stores and all that. I think the way that you do that is you have a strong school system. That's how you bring Great. people into our community. And that's how you revive a downtown. I agree. Preaching to the choir, you know, so go the town, so go the schools. Right. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we want to be major players in that space. Um, you know, and we know that we need to grow incrementally mm -hmm. in a footprint that, that is, um, that can be sustainable over time. Right. Um, but you know, I, I, I'm excited for the future and what, what the future holds for Wakefield. I think it's going to be, a really great place to live because of the planning that's happening now. Agreed. Council McQueen? A couple of questions. Um, I was looking at the chart for the uh, personnel component for 22, 23, and um, are the one through 12 numbers, does that represent years in service? Yes. So at least from a teacher standpoint, it kind of looks like we're having pretty good retention. Am I reading that correctly? Because it doesn't look like we have uh, anybody that hasn't been around for a few years. We have the highest teacher retention rate in the Middlesex League. Excellent, excellent. And I assume MP30 is master's plus 30 credit hours. Is that kind of how yes, the sir. scale goes the other way? Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, and I have to say, having been involved in getting some of the starting teacher uh, numbers collapsed here with a parent group any number of years ago, I'm glad to see what we see here because I think it looks good. I also think, having argued at school committee uh, budgetary meetings for the extra teacher at the Walton Do or Doyle, um, I think the class sizes are looking very good and I'm very encouraged by it. 
and I appreciate everything you guys are doing to, uh, to keep those numbers where they should be. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just add, uh, everything everybody said is, is great. Um, can I ask a, a fairly, my <laughs> a specific question? You know, we, the town passed the bylaw on styrofoam over a year ago, and we've had lots of time for waivers. And, and I, it's not just, I know there's supply issues, and I don't think it's a top priority. Don't get me wrong. But I do think it's a priority. I do think you need to lead by example. And I think the students that I hear from care about this. And I just wonder whether that was taken into consideration in your budget. Christine has been working with Danielle on this. And this is, a lot of this has to do with, with the ability to get what we need at a, you know, a, at the cost that we need to get it at, right? And so um, do you want to add to this, Christine? If Danielle was here, she'd be like, if I can find it, I will use it. And she's fabulous. And I know she's been working really hard. Right. right. It, yeah. it, it's, a, it's amazing about what you can't, things that we would normally be able to get in bulk. I mean, she she's part of a, a collaborative buying um, unit with other um, districts. And we're trying to get the best prices. And we understand that this is something that we're moving forward to. to but right now, that would even increase our costs more next year. Um, and we're just worried about what next year the meal prices are going to do to some of our families because it, it has been free for so long. So it is part of our plan. We are working towards that. Um, but we just want to be thoughtful about hitting everything at once for next year. Absolutely. So thank you. I just wanted to make sure it was on your radar. Oh, definitely. Great. Madam Chair, I have a fourth grader at home who's very into this issue and would be glad that you asked that question. I, uh, <laughs> I, I know. It, it sounds, everything you're doing, there's just, everything's yeah. been so heavy. But I, I really believe that the students care about this and that, mm -hmm. you know, you probably have the biggest influence on talent on, on everybody. So, so thank you for all your efforts. Anybody else have anything else to add? Can I just ask one other question? Sure. Um, and this is uh, a little, not, not necessarily budget related, but uh, I, I've heard a rumor, uh, Superintendent Lyons, that we need to uh, soon refer to you as Dr. Lyons. Is that correct? Congratulations. Congratulations. Right. Good job, Doc. Because you've had nothing else to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> In his spare time. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, it's true. Um, I'll, I'll be graduating in May, fortunately. Oh, well, wonderful. Wonderful. Congratulations. Excellent. Great. Yeah. OK, so I don't think we have any action we need to take on this. Um, but we will see you at town meeting and look forward to, to supporting you there. Thank you for the support. Thank you so Thank much. You very much. Thank you. OK. Um, Moving on to item number nine, licenses. We have a number of, let's see here, two one-day licenses. Mm -hmm. um, the first being for Thomas Markham for a one-day liquor license for a campaign social fundraiser on uh, April 4th at the America Civic Center. So moved. Second. Moved by Councillor Butt, seconded by Councillor Santos. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Uh, aye. Opposed? 7-0, motion passes. Um, item B, request from the Wakefield Linfield Chamber of Commerce for a one-day liquor license for a fundraiser on May 26th at the Wakefield Bolodrome, which is very intriguing. Oh, I know. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to tell you, George Clooney will not be there. Oh. <laughs> ben ben Affleck. Ben Affleck. Maybe Ben Affleck. Ben Affleck. Yeah. Yeah. See, the Wakefield Bolodrome is yeah. quite yeah, the place. Um, uh, do I have a motion? So moved. <laughs> Second. Um, any discussion on this? Seeing none, all in favor? <coughs> all opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. And finally, we have a request from King's Flavor, located at 61 New Salem Street, for a common vic vicular, vicular license. Um, so moved. Second. Moved by Councillor Butt and seconded by Councillor Santos. Any questions on this? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 10, um, so we have two, this is not really a review, well, I guess so, yeah, some of this is a review of the policy. Is Benny Wheat on, Sherry, from yes. Human Rights? So the first um, was a request from the Human Rights um, Committee, um, and, and they've been um, looking at this for a number of months, and I thought it's probably time just to open it up 
to the um, to the council for discussion. I'm going to have to rely very heavily on Mr. Mullen on this because there are a number of legal issues involved in it. Um, but while we'll, we'll wait for Benny Wheat, just for context, um, we did pass a flag policy back in 2019, um, and the and the Human Rights Commission has taken advantage of that at the Americal, particularly for June um, events, Pride events. She's on. She's coming. Okay. Hi, Benny. Yep, she's on. Hi. Hi. How are you? Why don't you introduce yourself, and if you want to give any comments on what you're thinking on the flag policy. What's going on with my camera? You were there. Okay. Yeah, she's there. Yeah. Uh, hi, Benny Wheat. I live at 44 Miriam Street in Wakefield. I'm the chair of the Wakefield Human Rights Commission. Um, I have like a very tiny slide presentation. Should I put that up? You can do that. You can share your screen. Mm. Um, let's go back to the beginning. Okay, so the Wakefield Human Rights Commission, um, I think collaborated with you all a couple of years ago when the town created the flag policy, um, and the hope was to be able to raise the pride flag without opening the town up to other risk of having to raise like hateful flags or things like that. Um, and so that's been a really wonderful thing for the past couple of years to be able to raise the pride flag. And then also last year, the Juneteenth flag um, but we've sort of received some input from the community around this, so it kind of prompted me to ask for some revisions to the flag policy. So over the past couple of years, but like most notably in my mind, last year, I started getting contacted by folks in town saying, how come Wakefield doesn't raise the pride flag? <laughs> And I was like, Wakefield does raise the pride flag. <laughs> but this picture of the AmeriCall Civic Center, so the, the flag policy right now is tied to the AmeriCall Civic Center and the AmeriCall Civic Center's flagpole, which as you can see in this picture, in June, if you didn't know that flagpole was there, like, if I didn't know it was there, I wouldn't know where to look for it. Like, I wouldn't even know there was a flagpole there because it's unfortunately behind a tree. Um, so I started sort of getting contacted by folks in town and thinking about like how can we increase the visibility of the flags that we do want to fly to, you know, to message inclusion and belonging. Um, and so there's a couple of issues. One is visibility, like actual like line of sight, being able to see the flag. The other is what um, happened last year, which is we now are hoping to fly both the Pride flag and the Juneteenth flag, but both of those events take place in June. And so because the current flag policy only has one flagpole that's named, which is that um, Civic Center flag, flagpole, what we did was we raised the, flag, the pride flag on June 1st. And then for the week surrounding Juneteenth, we took the pride flag down and put the Juneteenth flag up. And then at the end of that week, we put the pride flag back up. And it's just kind of a little bit of a jumble. Um, so what we're asking for is two things, two amendments to the flag policy. One is to permit eligible bodies to request that flags be flown on more than one flagpole in the town. So this would, I talked this over with Tom Mullen, which was extremely helpful, thank you, Mr. Mullen, um, about sort of what are the legal protections that are in place? Are there ways we can amend this policy without exposing the town to additional risk um, and it sounded to me like it wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily open the town to more risk if we were to include additional flagpoles in that policy if we retain the sort of like heart of that protection which is that only town bodies are eligible to request these flags so in the policy it says either town bodies like the town council or the human rights commission or any of the commissions or committees or the other category is not i can't remember the wording it's like nonprofits who exist specifically to support a town body uh for example i think basically that means the friends of the bb uh, is the only nonprofit i can think of that fits that description so anyway so this the amendment that we are asking for would retain that so only town bodies and these specific this special kind of nonprofit 
would be allowed to request that flags be flown, which retains the protection to the town, you know, on the assumption that there aren't any town commissions or like departments or anything that are going to ask us to raise a hateful flag or a flag that does not uh, convey the, the values of the town. So that would stay in place. But what we're asking to change is one, that more flagpole locations be included in the in the wording. Um, my hope would be that it would be any flagpole in town um, could be requested. This is separate from the school's flagpoles, so they they would retain you know control over their own flagpoles. But other town-owned flagpoles, um, a body could request uh, to fly a flag on on whichever one of those seemed appropriate. Um, Certainly that would always be at the discretion of the town council. You know, we would continue to bring a request that could be approved or denied or amended or whatever. Um, or at the very least, if not all flagpoles, the three that strike me as the most visible are the Civic Center, which is already in there, Town Hall and Veterans Field. Um, so those are, those are the thoughts around the location of the actual flagpoles. And then another piece that I am interested in requesting a change around is, um, so in the current policy, it says, you know, a town body that is renting space at the AmeriCall Civic Center for a sanctioned event can request to fly a flag at the AmeriCall Civic Center flagpole. And another change that we're hoping to see is that it not be tied specifically to renting space at the AmeriCall Civic Center. For example, this year, the HRC has been granted um, a permit to have a pride concert on the common in June. So something along those lines, it seems to me, still fits the, the intention of the policy that the body is having a town sanctioned event um, on town property that they have like reserved or, or rented or whatever. Um, and they're requesting to fly a flag in, in conjunction with that. So those are the two changes that we're hoping to make the like diversify the pool of flagpoles that are available to us and also diversify the pool of town spaces that are available for for the kind of um, the event that's tied to that flag raising. Great. Thank you. That was very well yeah, presented. Cool. Very well great. laid out. Thanks, Penny. Um, Mr. Mullen, did you want to add anything, or you just want to? We'll discuss, and if it comes up. No, I have um, no problem with these uh, these two proposed changes. That is, uh, uh, expanding from the one flagpole location to multiple potential flagpole locations, um, and and also moving from um, the requirement that the organization that makes the request be renting space in a particular building to one that has reserved, whether rent through rental or otherwise, uh, space uh, of any kind anywhere in the uh, from the town government. Okay. I, I think that's that's fairly safe. Okay. Yeah. So it doesn't sound like we're in any legal, mm -hmm. we, we can discuss this as just a policy. Councilor Tynes. Yes, uh, just a, a question on that through you, Madam Chair. Would that include uh, the schools as sort of any town property, or how, how does that play out just in terms of our authority as the council versus yeah. the, the school committee? Well, I think the request is limited to town as opposed to school okay. property, and I'd prefer to ha keep it that way because uh, even if we have an argument that the town council uh, is in charge of the real estate that the schools occupy, I don't think you want to push the school department around in that particular way. I mean, they have programmatic responsibility for the use of their premises. So any Councilor Santos? I think the changes um, certainly align with the intent when we first created this flag policy um, to protect um, the town, to make it so that certain um, groups We'd have to jump through a few hoops. We wanted to make sure who was raising um, flags. And I don't know that we had thought necessarily, you know, just keeping it on the Civic Center, what you suggested, Benny, makes perfect sense, that if someone's renting the, the town common, um, they could use it. These, I think these changes are in, an, are in alignment with um, what we thought about. And to have a more visible 
um, showing of these flags just makes us um, more inclusive and a more welcoming community. So I'm good. Agreed. Anyone else? I think we, we just need to be thoughtful about what this what the implications are um, and not necessarily about the two flags we've spoken about because I mean those are obvious ones mm -hmm. um, you know Juneteenth and the pride flag understood um, I, th I think uh, right now I think we have um, POW MIA flag at, at town hall I'm concerned about losing that you know potentially you know um, for other flags um, but I'm also but I'm more concerned about the idea of what um, you know? What kind of parameters we're we're going to be setting for additional flags beyond what we've talked about? And does that mean that every um, flag is going to be, you know, um, every request is going to result in three flags you know across town? I mean, I don't know you know, um, but I think we need to be thinking about that because it's not like, not just the pride flag, not just the Juneteenth flag, but if we start to have more and more groups that are saying, hey, we want to put this one and that one, what is that going to do? You know, is, is that a problem? I don't know. Um, it very well may not be, but I think we need to be thoughtful about that. And is it going to be a request of, is it going to be three? You know, so you have three like kind flags on all three flagpoles. I don't know. Do we say we limit it to two? I don't know if we, we even make that We can say no, I would assume. We, we, we can, but I, but I think the idea of just kind of having a, like a going policy or understanding of, you know, what our intentions are, because to your point, um, uh, Councilor Santos, we, I think this does align with our intention mm -hmm. of being able to have, you know, um, flags on, on other poles. I just don't know that it necessarily means that we have three flags of every request across, but how do we kind of, you know, call balls and strikes on that one? I think that's something we need to think about. Councilor Danny? Well, maybe we get another flagpole for <laughs> the occasional flags that are, you know, the pride flag that will be in June. And then if that becomes an issue, but I don't think that we should, I, I, I don't think that that should be a reason for us not to vote on this. And I think you raise good points, but I think we can figure that, I think we can figure that out. Um, uh, yeah, I think we can figure that out. And I, and I agree with you about um, you know, the flags that we have now, you know, displacing one flag for another flag. Um, but I, I just think it's, I just think it's a really good sign for our community that shows our, our commitment to inclusivity. And we spent a lot of time talking about it, but this is a way to really show it. I just think it, I'm sorry. I just think it's specifically about that POW MIA flag and how that's a very important flag to a lot of people. And the idea of displacing that flag, especially given its proximity to the Upper Common and all the important, mm -hmm. you know, remembrances and history there. That those are the sorts of things I'm thinking about. Yeah. So these are I'm talking more unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. sure. what, you sure. know, what, we're we're doing this with the best of intentions, but I do think we need to be able to be thinking forward about all right. Well, what do we do if we encounter this? You know, certain mm -hmm. requests, and it's not HRC related at all. It's just in general because mm -hmm. this is a, a broad policy. Mm -hmm. well, and it, could we get another flag pole? Well, I mean, is that? I mean, wait, there's a flag. I was looking at this today trying to think about this as well. So there is a flagpole at the Upper Common that flies both the American flag and the POW MIA. I think it's great it also has flown, you know, much of the year at Town Hall. But I, but I think, um, you know, taking it down for one or two months for other things seems consistent. And we're not going to touch that Upper Common flag. That should never be touched, in my opinion. And I don't think it's part of the proposal that Benny's made. Mm -hmm. Council uh, Just uh, through you, uh, maybe to Mr. Mayo, uh, just a question. How many requests have we gotten since this policy went into place in terms of flying flags? I mean, I... Two. Two. I was going to say, and are they both yeah. June, are they the Juneteenth and Pride flag? June. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> and granted, I guess, you know, two of the last three years have been odd because right. we, we haven't had many events at the America Hall, but it doesn't seem like we've had a huge outcry here. We had one when we made the policy. Oh, that we did that we didn't honor. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I don't remember that one. <laughs> so I, I guess from my perspective, I think in in light of the fact that that's been the experience, um, in light of the fact that you know I, I absolutely agree with Councilor Dombrowski that you know having the the POWMIA flag is is really important, and the fact that that is sort of permanently displayed 
um, you know, only a hundred yards away from Town Hall uh, on the Common as a as a place of reverence. I you know I think this is something that I'm I'm comfortable with as well. I think it does hue to the intention of what we had in mind when we came together with the original flag policy. And we would approve all we would approve all flags, all applications. Yes. Yeah. So. And the applications have to be very specific about where they want to be. I mean, I, I, I guess I agree that, you know, having the same flag on three flagpoles probably doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's something we can talk about. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think I think HRC really wants one flag, probably one pride flag to fly somewhere all month and the Juneteenth flag. And Juneteenth is now a state holiday as well. Mm -hmm. So. And I was going to say, and the, the policy still also requires the sponsoring organization to give us the flags, too. So if the request Absolutely. is they're going to have three flags, they've got to supply us with three flags, right? Right. And we can still say no. And we could still say no. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Three. Yep. I agree. Any motion? Can I just point yep. out one thing, yes. Madam Chair? Just so the, the council is aware that there are times at town hall via a gubernatorial order, we do lower the flag to yeah. half mast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that may occur when another flag is below. And I just, I just say, I don't want anybody to say, why did this happen? Well, mm -hmm. it kind of came because mm -hmm. of a gubernatorial order. So if you just have so to go to half mass, do you have to take down the uh, second probably flag? Probably not at town hall because I'm not, I don't think it's low enough that it's an issue okay. because someone could damage it, you mm -hmm. know. Um, okay. But I just want, I don't want this council to get any information back later on, like why did this happen? Well, right. That's yeah. why. And would that apply as well to the Americal? I mean, if we have no, we have a good... the the gubernatorial order only goes only to the main administrative okay. building mm -hmm. in town. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's you know, national. You know, when Colin Powell died, yep. for instance, yeah. mm -hmm. we were ordered by the governor when someone is killed, mm -hmm. a soldier abroad, mm -hmm. then that that comes in from the governor. That's why that's often lowered. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just so the council is aware of that. Okay. Um, so we have a motion to, I guess what we'd, ha we'd have to do is a, to adopt the two changes. Let's see, how are you going to make this motion? I don't know. That's what I was... <laughs> I think, can I, can I yeah, please. The yes. motion might be to um, authorize me to come back with a redrafted policy that incorporates both like of the that. requests. <laughs> 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 Ding. Okay. Motion to authorize Tom to come back to us with a redrafted policy based on Benny's recommendations. Second. Um, any additional discussion? So are, are we focused then on the three flagpoles that we've been talking about, AmeriCal, um, Vetsfield, and Town mm -hmm. Hall? Is that what we're talking about specifically? So mm -hmm. that Mr. Miller knows mm -hmm. that. So I, I think we should be specific in the policy for yep. that as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And what we're not, uh, and what we're not proposing. So. Um, the Veterans Memorial Common, the yep. schools. Sorry, just another question on that. Um, are, are there other flagpoles in town that potentially would be at play? I'm just think, trying to remember if there's anything other than kind of the schools and the and the cemeteries. Isn't that, there? Isn't there one on Spalding yes, Park? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So tell us where. That um, is. Upper Common, of course. Town Hall, Vetsfield. We talked about Colonel Conley Park. Okay. There's yeah. a flag. Oh. Um, the Senior Center. There's a flag. Oh. Patty Heights, there's a flag, which is on Melvin, up there. Uh, Blattsfield, there's a flag, as we know. Landrigan Field, there's a flag. Um, Forest Glade in the veterans section. Police Station, and also the schools. Uh, Molten Field, we do have a flag um, uh, pole. We normally only um, display that on Memorial Day and 9-11. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And uh, JJ Round, there's a flag pole. It's seldom used. So there are quite a few. That complicates. So <laughs> limited yeah, complicate days, things but. a little bit. <laughs> um, I, I guess if, if I could suggest, um, I think there are a couple of other locations where I, I don't think we would want to allow for the display of flags. Certainly Forest Glade would be one of them. Um, you know, I wonder if, if Patty Heights, just given that that is sort of a memorial location, would be another one. There may be others that you mentioned, Steve, that I've now forgotten, but. I think if you start with the three yeah, that were mentioned. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's start okay. with yeah. those. Yeah. You could put in there. So well, for, for purposes of the policy, I, I was anticipating just speaking generically about town-owned flagpoles. And in response to any given request, you can decide 
which flagpoles you want to fly which flags from. And so the other thing that I like about that is I could see a scenario, maybe there's a display you want to put at the senior center, sure. um, you know, if there's an event going on there. But, um, or at the police station. Or at the police station, exactly. Yeah, so let's make it as generic as possible. Okay, so I don't think that that changes the motion. No. Um, uh, any additional discussion? No. Okay, um, all in favor of the motion? Uh, opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. So um, thank you. Thanks, Benny. Benny, Thanks, Benny. 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 really great. So I have a question. Should yeah. I come back? Because I had also submitted the proposal, but it's like contingent on the policy. So should I resubmit the proposal once this has been approved? Why don't you do that? I think we can be ready to vote on this at our next meeting, um, which is what, like April 11th? 11th. And then that should give you time, right? To um, you oh, can yeah. come back even that day if you want, or the twenty fifth, and it should give you time to to get everything set up for June. Yeah, that sounds fine. Okay, great. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you, Thank you very you. much Bye. for your work. Okay. Um, okay. So then our next policy is the bench and lake structure policy, and um, a request for memorial remembrance. I'm going to turn this right over to Steve because yes. the way we wrote this policy it first comes to him and then the grievance, right. grievances so, come to us. Well, it's it's <laughs> it's more of a um, this is not a not a flag, it's not a it's not a bench. We spent a lot of time talking about benches, uh, councilor Button and I including inventorying them at like at 7 degrees one morning. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, that was 2019. I thought it was before that. Uh, I was actually 2017, I think, okay. when we did. No, no, it was 2019. I'm sorry. Was it really? Yeah, it was 2019. It yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was in year yeah. 17. Um, I thought it was early. So this is a request to um, create a um, remembrance, a memorial remembrance, which is basically a um, kind of a small um, library, I guess, a little library kiosk. Is, is anybody on, Sherry, from the... Yeah, Michael oh, Newhall. Oh, Michael on. Newhall may, may want to come on. Um, per the policy, um, it seems to me that the, that the council should have a 30-day comment section. Mm -hmm. That's what we put in there for any other items um, other than memorial benches, which were prohibited. There should be a 30-day um, uh, uh, you know, public comment section. We already heard one this evening, and I guess we're getting a letter on that uh, to go forward. I think it would behoove the council to wait the 30 days because I think you should hear from all parties. And perhaps Mr. Newhall wants to say a few words where he is the petitioner. But that's up to you, Madam Chair. Yeah, so yeah. please, Mr. Newhall, welcome. Thank you. Um, nice to, to meet you all tonight. I. Uh, I've had some some great experience. You know, Sherry, would it be okay if I shared uh, the slides that I have as well? J Julie, would sure. you? Yes, that's fine. Want him to show Go ahead and share your screen. Okay. And we also, I believe, have them in the packet too for yeah. the public. Okay. Let me just. Uh, not. Oh, here we go. Thank you. Okay, I hope that's visible. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we, we've, uh, so Sentinel's had some experience working with the town and, and has um, really enjoyed the partnership that we had when we worked way back in 2017. It's hard to believe it's five years already. Um, but, but Steve and uh, Richard Stinson, um, who at the time was the uh, public works director, um, were very helpful in this process. And I think that one of the things that we, really uh, intended to do at that time and intend to do at this time was to, um, to sort of partner with the town and looking at how we can enhance spaces, in this case, the space that was out our front door, out our driveway there. Um, and we're, we're quite proud. Uh, I, I have an intern that's working with me, a high school intern, and had him put a little PowerPoint together here. But I wanted to show, you know, the bench was installed in partnership with the town. The bench uh, looks virtually the same as it did uh, five years ago. And that was very intentional. We wanted to make sure that when we did this, we we did this with that in mind, that this was not going to deteriorate, this would be maintained well. And we as a, as a company are very proud of maintaining that space. Um, I'm sure that many of you who walk the lake 
see the space. Uh, we try to keep plantings there in the spring and the summertime, maintain that area and keep it looking uh, nice. So that all said, um, you know, previous to previous to this, we had an area there that really just wasn't something that um, was was accepting of um, you know people hanging around by the side of the, the, the shore there. There was deterioration in the shoreline. We helped the town with with um, putting some of the um, so wall there. It's a space that helped the shoreline from continuing to deteriorate. And we take a lot of pride in seeing people sitting on the bench and using that area in a safe manner now. And I think that by saying all of that, what I want to say is that that's where this idea came from uh, with this little free library. We see so many people sitting on the bench and enjoying the space. An another enhancement to the area was something that our group was proposing. Um, and, you know, this individual who is with our company for over 25 years uh, certainly was a motivation uh, behind choosing this enhancement, this little library, given that literacy was a very big part of her charitable um, life as well. So that's where we came up with the idea of the uh, little library. Uh, Sherry's been uh, helpful in letting me um, you know, recognize the policy that's in place here. And I guess what our intent ultimately is, is to look at the space that is uh, in existence with the existing bench and uh, asking the town um, to look at the policy to see if there might be a possibility to enhance that specific space by adding a small uh, library structure there that would either be, um, you know, somewhere between uh, 36 and 40 inches high uh, in the flower bed, um, uh, you know, as a piece of the bench area there. Great. Okay, so there's, there's various views of how these can look, but um, in a sense, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now, but, um, if I can do that. Sorry about that. Thanks. Oh, okay. So, so that's what we're hoping okay. for your consideration. Great. Thank you. Um, so Steve, it sounds like we would then open this up for 30 days and probably come back right. at our, it's, it's 30 days or two meetings or two meetings. Sure. I remember so when we did April, the policy. April so, 25th, so April 25th. Right. Okay. And we'll have Jen put that out on the website. So okay. We so yes, yeah, so we'll um, solicit feedback and we'll make the decision on April 25th. How helpful is it uh, for people to see that there are various ways of uh, installing and various types of uh, book case structures that could uh, work better or potentially not as, as well um, in that space? I think any feedback provided would be um would be welcomed. So I think that would be helpful. Just, you know, what you're imagining. I think that'd be great. We're, you know, we're feeling this out as well. And mm -hmm. I think that in the end, we would want to do what, whatever would work best for uh, the town, the space. And I recognize that there was a comment earlier that uh, this falls under the structure policy or under the uh, mm -hmm. memorial policy. Um, but, you know, this could be potentially a removable bookcase. So there could be a two season bookcase. There are various ways that this could be done. Yeah, I think anything that you want to share like that yeah. would be helpful. Okay. Great. I would be uh, remiss if I did not uh, say a quick hello to uh, Councillor McLean, who I have experience with in my past life as a school administrator. <laughs> um, so <laughs> nice to see you again, Michael. Good to see you, Mike. I hope uh, the family's well. <laughs> All, all good here. It was fun to listen to all that presentation, for sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Councilor Chines, you had a, you had a Some question? Some memories. Uh, j just a question, uh, Madam Chair, maybe uh, through you to Mr. Mullen. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Mayo. Uh, so in that area, it, it seems like we still have a, a few kind of picnic tables and things that are there. Do we know, are, are um, those town picnic tables? They're not tables town or? picnic tables. They are not owned by the town. Do we no. know? I, I, um, I don't know. I have an idea. I'm not really sure. I think they're the businesses in the area. They belong to the school. They, you know, I talked to um, Dennis Fazio about them. They uh, people maintain around them that own them, and they seem to be okay right now. So people seem to enjoy them. So, 
I guess I, it's something yeah. that I, I, I mean, just because it's, uh, I mean, we are looking at yeah. sort of structures that have been put, been put on the shoreline without going through us. That, that does concern me. And I, I guess it would be helpful just to know I how they got there, who put yep. them there, and um, I'll try to find that if out. <laughs> they would like to maintain them there. I mean, I'd like that to come back to this mm -hmm. council for discussion. We also have a new fence that was put up by the town that probably should have come to us as well. <laughs> so, so look at that. I'm also, just because it's, it's a part of this presentation, um, th I recall the bench coming before us, I guess, in 2017. Right. Um, I don't recall anything beyond that. And I know that f between the bench, there's a there's bench on, on a concrete slab, but then there's this, there's this, like, several feet of pavers heading towards the water. And I don't recall that ever being a part of what our approval process mm -hmm. was. And it, it's... There's now plantings and there's a, a mm -hmm. number of other elements to it. I, I understood us to be approving the bench at, on that on the, on the concrete footing, and that was the extent of it. So I don't know, perhaps we could just, uh, Madam Clerk, if you could just you know, perhaps pull that from 2017 and let us know what exactly had been approved. Because I, I, I don't recall there being you know, as much as there ended up being. And I do think, if you look at it visually, it, it takes up a good amount of the the, that footage, that frontage of right in front of the lake there. Okay. Good. So we can we can look at all these things right. as well and bring it back on the twenty fifth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Mr. Newell, thank Great. you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, item eleven. Outdoor uh, dining. Item eleven. Okay. Um, as the uh, as the council knows, over the last um, I guess two years. Uh, we have enjoyed um, outdoor usage of property, and I say outdoor use, public way usage, not just um, restaurants, because some of the businesses have also come out and okay. done a nice job. So um, thought I would bring this up, kind of get ahead of the curve, because we are getting inquiries from a lot of the businesses that would like to continue to come out um, into, the, uh, into the street if they can. So um, where we are right now with the state is both chambers have passed the supplemental budget. Um, both chambers included the extension of outdoor dining through April 1st, among other, uh, 2023, among some other things. Um, current provisions expire April 1st, 2022. Uh, and the conference committee will meet and hopefully send the bill to the governor for signature this week. That's what I was told by our, um, our state delegation last Thursday night. But we'll see what happens at this point. We don't have anything. So again, trying to get a little bit ahead of the curve on this. So outdoor means outdoor. It doesn't mean half in, half out on the sidewalk. It means outdoor. Um, this is kind of the past things that we've looked at. No bars, mm -hmm. okay? Um, umbrellas only, no tents. We talked about that after the first year. Mm -hmm. Tents seem to be unsightly and not safe, and umbrellas, I think, add more of an ambiance. Um, zoning relief is not necessary because of the legislation, and the local authority on liquor license, all, uh, local authority on liquor license alterations, as the council knows, when you alter your business and you alter your liquor license, it actually has to go into the ABCC. It's a much longer process. This kind of legislation has negated this, you know, because of what happened during COVID. But I think we have to think about post-COVID now and kind of the new normal that we're talking about. So some considerations for outdoor usage. Um, establishments must complete, complete an application, and we have a pretty robust application through our portal. It goes around, again, to all of the departments. You saw a few of them today, and I think it's a great way. You see what every department has seen it. We're not waiting for someone. Um, applicant must provide own tables, chairs, specific area restrictions, and or coverings. We don't give them tables or chairs, although I think a few of us had put, have put some together for did. some of the businesses <laughs> over the years. Um, <laughs> um, they must... Um, follow uh, Mass and Local Board of Health Safety Protocols. And I know I, I harp on no bar seating, but I get a lot of questions, can we have a bar there? And mm -hmm. the answer is no. <laughs> I think it's for dining and for more mm -hmm. of that area. So Wakefield adopted a lot of this, um, allow business to utilize these public spaces for business activities. Um, zoning issues are relaxed, as we talked about. Footprints for liquor license can be all by the town council. Adherence to state and local guidelines, clear application, I have a couple of differences in bold this year that I would like the council to consider. Area to be designated mirrors facade limit. So in other words, I think that we are, you know, we don't have the same restrictions on indoor use that we had before. And we were very liberal in letting businesses going past their 
their storefront footage, right? I'm saying that maybe we should mirror their facade. I think it's a little bit fairer, for lack of a better word. Um, hours to reflect their regular business hours. Um, and I put in there May 1st to December 1st. I don't think anybody will go to December 1st. We're not as hardy as maybe some people are. May 1st is a startup date, which is contingent upon a lot of things happening, including having approval from the legislature on this. Um, application of the portal I talked about. And bold town to provide barriers and hold on to that one for a second. Um, business cares for the area. Now, they're in charge of their area and the barriers. Um, and they're in charge of caring for the barriers, and I'll show you that in a second. And these can be revoked at any time. There is at any time that we found that it's been abused, it's been, um, uh, we have a snowstorm, we have a whatever, we can, we can revoke that at any time. That probably goes more towards the end. You know, if they're still out there on November 1st and we have a snowstorm coming, we may have to pull them right away. So I have been asked um, or mentioned many times by um, Councilor Santos, so I guess occasionally goes out of town. Occasionally. Occasionally. Yeah. And um, you mentioned the Andover ones. Did. Yeah. So um, nice. Which are flowered and um, uh, we have reached out to the area where they got them, the, the vendor where they got them. I think these would be great. Um, I would think the town could provide them. We could use them in other areas. Yeah, we could use them for events that we have yeah. and really would give some nice uniformity. Yeah. Yeah. And the plantings on those, which maybe you can't, I can't see without my glasses on, but if you put them on, you can see them. The businesses would have to take care of Beautiful. them. Yeah. Okay. Um, another thing that I will talk to the businesses about is that I want to make sure they're trying to, they're making every attempt, if not completely complying with what was mentioned in the school department today about the styrofoam and things like that. If we're going to give them something, they should really work with us better. Um, so what I would ask that the council do this evening is to authorize the town administrator with inputs from health agent and emergency management director to approve alteration of liquor license and food service footprints for both public and private spaces. Um, private, really, it's just the, the extension of the liquor license. Um, allow retail to enter the public way, provide at, provided access is sufficient, and consider requirement of uniform if you have barriers. barriers. And I would consider that is a use in that business mm -hmm. bucket mm -hmm. for opera funds. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, personally, I've heard from a lot of people uh, a number of people who are still a little hesitant about going inside. Mm -hmm. They really enjoy the vibrancy out there. I know that um, when it first we first started outdoor dining, boy, was it like um, it was like Christmas morning for everybody that mm -hmm. was out there, and they were really people hadn't seen each other in months, and probably broke every COVID c protocol <laughs> at the time because people were hugging and and and, and uh, seeing. But there are a lot of people that have stopped me. In fact, I had a couple that stopped me couple of weeks ago outside and it was a beautiful that beautiful Friday it was 70 degrees mm -hmm. and uh, asked me do you have any outdoor dining and I said well geez you know we have a place that opens windows but not yet because they were still hesitant about going inside mm -hmm. so I think we have yeah. to be very conscious of that mm -hmm. so um, I'd like to be able to uh, proceed with this if and when it happens uh, again we've had a lot of businesses contact us uh, about this so that's where I am and open for questions uh, I really like the idea of the uniformity. Um, I think that that adds a, a whole different dimension to this, which is important. Um, I, I don't know that it has to be necessarily explicit in this policy, but I think back to a certain business on Water Street that had like a very tall kind of barrier. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, it, it was it was not the most visually appealing. Right. Um, yeah. And so the idea of having any kind of, you know, modifications, I think should be prohibited. You know, I think we have this and it, it's safe. The other piece to it um, is um, the ability to have some sort of outdoor heaters. And um, I know, like in the past, that was that's that's been important, especially in the spring, especially at night. So being able to allow for that, as long as you know we're in accordance right. with whatever the fire right. department. And I don't exactly. know if they have certain standards. Right. And that's yet, that's okay with the with the um, okay. umbrellas. Yeah. The tents prohibited that right. as well. Yeah. So exactly. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, but I just think now we're to a point where we can kind of focus more on the aesthetic of this mm -hmm. because yes. the functionality we know, we know works, but let's focus on the aesthetic and try to make mm -hmm. it so that it feels more inviting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is my legacy. I will. This is your legacy. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be the Ann Santos <laughs> barriers. Yes. But the uniformity, I don't know if you 
people have driven through Andover when yeah. they have it up. The uniformity is beautiful, it and is. the flowers, and Absolutely. it just yeah. it really makes a huge difference. So, I'm for it. I love it. Can can I ask that we just think about maybe one or two that are not affiliated with an existing business, where just anybody, if you got a coffee at a coffee shop that you could sit down. I mean, if we're buying the barriers, mm. is there one or two places that we can can have more of a public where people could take a piece of pizza or a coffee and, and go go and sit down? I know other towns have done that. Yeah, I know it's yeah. more complex. You know, you have probably furniture you have to keep care of, and but. Yeah, I think we can certainly might look be doing yeah. yeah, I've said before, I think the Greenwood schools, particularly in the summer when the schools close, like that front, you know, doing it kind of... On the lawn. It, on the lawn, yeah, because yeah, I think it's not that bad of a walk. I also think, um, as there are less people commuting to um, using the commuter rail, particularly the Greenwood stuff, all those parking spots are not being used, right? It's a little bit of a walk from the restaurants. But I think if people know there's picnic benches and a nice area to sit, maybe we put a little bocce set or something, you know? Like, we can actually make it those little parklet area as a trial, kind of think about it. But, you know, people could grab something from Blue Moon, walk over, um, especially if we have the uniform, like they know what they're looking for. But <laughs> yeah. I love that idea of just kind of okay. thinking, beyond because there are you know smaller coffee shops don't do it or you know the ice well, and their cream facade shop. would be so teeny right, right. Yeah. it would be so right. narrow so i think looking at maybe like a you know yeah. andover has that yeah well, melrose has it again melrose did it yeah, too they which is kind of yeah. like mm -hmm. right in the downtown areas yep. mm -hmm. okay we can identify some spaces yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I and mean, we probably sell the adirondack chairs from the front of the yeah we'll put, put those probably back yeah. up in yep. the library front of the yeah. library yeah yep. that's nice yeah. Great. So, do you need us to vote on I, this? I think I'd like a motion the, to go forward okay. with this pending, pending you know, the legislation state and decision. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, do we have a motion to move forward with the public? What were we calling it? Oh, can I ask Outdoor one more usage. question? Because we are Santos using the boundaries. So, we are. It's not just the sidewalk, right? It'll go on to the. No, it'll go. Place. It'll yes. be parking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, we need a motion to adopt the um and santos uniformity the barrier, santos <laughs> barrier. <laughs> santos public use of it gets the pit you get the barrier <laughs> that's right I, I get the styrofoam viral uh, like cool in there. make a motion all based winners on, in this on steve's um recommendations it's okay. seconded okay so a uh, motion made by councillor santos and seconded by councillor Bart. and just discussion this doesn't cost the businesses anything right no. there's no, no license or fee or anything no. No. just yes. wanted to make sure no. like the following the boston uh, no. controversy the north end. yeah no. i know not the the mm. bio uh, north end <laughs> no. the mayo north end policy no. No. the other thing that i would think is i know that some businesses have, that are not participating have expressed concern about parking. And um, yeah. I, I, Mr. Mayo, perhaps we could wor work on some, almost even, even consider temporary signage, redirecting people. Um, we have the daily item lot, for instance, where we have a good amount of, of spots available. Mm. But I think just letting people know that so that, um, because I understand if, if, you, if you're a business that is doing business on Main right. Street and mm -hmm. you don't, you know. And other, you other streets as well. And other yeah. streets, yeah. yeah, for that matter. So to the extent yeah. we can, you know, be thoughtful about how we can, you know, present that information to people too, right. so that they know. Yeah. Or they could take a right and just park on the street. Or oh, we could put up some bike racks. Street. And yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. I'm just right. exhausted. No, I know yeah. what you mean, but there's plenty of parking. Mm -hmm. Well, especially on the weekends too, I think people will find it you know, yeah, to be yeah. the case. Right. Um, right. But I, I think just being you know, highlighting that mm -hmm. right, is part of mm -hmm. our. You know, we will because the barriers are up all week; they're not going to come up. Mm -hmm. Exactly. No, exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I think this does really follow what we have uh, looked at in our um, when we did our surveys and what have you. Yeah. That people really want yeah. the outdoor usage. So I think the community yeah. aspect of it, yeah. when we've had it, has been really nice. Yeah. I mean, yeah. people just are out more; they're talking more; they're yeah. interacting. I mean, it. Mm -hmm. It does make downtown feel more absolutely, vibrant absolutely. and feel more welcoming to people than yeah. I, I think it's historically mm -hmm. been. So and and we have reached out to certain entities that maybe at certain times they, they need to reserve reserve some spaces for, you know, you know, specific usage and we'll give them cones and signs. Mm -hmm. yep. you know, Sunday morning and things mm -hmm. like that. Yep. Basically. So that's okay. kinda worked out okay. okay. I'll just remind people too that um, we had been talking about things like place making and outdoor dining pre-pandemic yeah. through the Envision project in like in oh, 2018 and 2019. Right. And at the time, some naysayers were saying, well, yeah, that's a great plan if you're in Florida. And now yeah. oh, they're absolutely. the first yeah. ones to be sitting oh, out right. there. So it's really right. kind of, you know, 
I think reset a lot of people's thinking. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but I think it just goes to show, you know, like we we as a town yet again we're ahead of the curve on that. That's right. So. Yeah, yeah. Forward okay. thinking. So, Ann, you're going to come and, like, do some gardening for some of you, right? I, 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 I was thinking letting her cut the ribbon, but maybe you, uh, the gardening and put you to work. Oh, sounds good. We're good. You're going to have all this time on your hands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, exactly. <laughs> okay, so we Thank have a motion, you. and we've had discussion. Um, all in favor? Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank motion you. passes oh. 7 to 0. Um, annual town meeting, we need to reset the <laughs> date to May 16th. Yeah. That's, that's due to um, school, some school issues that we ran into over there. So if the council would agree to having town meeting, which we can make later, as town council has told us, uh, per the per Mass General Law, uh, to have the May 16th date to start town meeting, and if we have to go a second day, it would be May 23rd, which just so people know, we don't have to vote on that. And that's a 7 p.m. start Monday. at Galvin Middle School. At Galvin Middle School, yes. Okay. So I have a motion to change the um, start of town meeting to May 16th. So moved. Second. Moved by Vice Chair Butt, seconded by Councillor Santos. Any additional discussion? Councillor Chines. J just a question. Um, do are, do we need to consider changing the date that we close the warrant? Um, we did the... extend it pretty, pretty far to April 7th. So I yep. think that will still let us get to the council on the 11th. OK. Um, mm -hmm. So we can post the warrant and we're going to try to post a warrant for the election and the town meeting together because we do save some money. Okay. And it's all within the statutory times. Okay. So if we waited to the 25th, it would be we wouldn't have enough time anyway if we extended mm -hmm. it past our meeting of the 11th. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good question. Any additional discussion? Seeing none. All in favor of changing the town meeting to May 16th? All opposed. Motion passes 7 to 0. Okay. We need to set a public hearing. For April 11th at 7.03 p.m. for a liquor license for LNB LLC doing business as Laurie's 909 located at 93 New Salem Street. So moved. Second. Moved by Vice Chair Butt, count, uh, seconded by Councillor Santos. A discussion on this? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion passes 7 to 0. Item 14. Um, this is a, there's a letter in our packet. The, is it Cowdery? Cowdery Fund, yes. Cowdery Fund. Yes. Um, some interest that needs to be transferred. Um, well, I guess I'll read it and then we'll do a motion. Do you want to, do you want to give any explanation? Sure, I can. So, so the Cowdery Fund uh, was money that was left to the town years and years and years ago. And um, uh, this hasn't happened since 2016 that we've, you know, um, actually been requested to kick some of the interest out to the Garden Club. But it was set up with that um, intent. And you know, oftentimes the, the the club would let's let it roll for a few years. We can do you know, what's a few hundred dollars? Let's do it and, and make more of a splash. So they did reach out to us this year, to check on it. And there's you know close to three thousand dollars in interest, almost twenty eight hundred. That is not town money. It was a donation, a, a, a grant or a, a legacy to the town, and they like to use it for some garden improvements and the garden club does a fabulous job I wonder if they'd them. like to plant some um, oh, they barriers plant, no. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually just at our earlier at our volunteer um, event Donna Murphy is on the garden club oh, okay. and so she said oh you're gonna you're gonna vote on this and they're really excited yeah. I mean twenty two hundred dollars is a lot yes. it's a couple of years they've got right. projects lined up great, um, yeah. we will have to mention the, uh, the I was, I'm kidding to them, I'm sure they have wonderful they're things really lined up. excited <laughs> it, it they have all these projects that you know they needed the funds for so this will go a long oh, way this one, great. great okay so um, I think I will just so basically there's interest being transferred from 2016 through 2021 for a total of $2,794.61 from the Calgary Fund to the Wakefield Garden Club. So moved. Seconded. Moved by Vice Chair Butt and seconded by Councillor Santos. Any additional discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? All opposed? Motion passes 7 to 0. Announcements. Councilor Dombrowski. I'll just announce to everyone that it's a very exciting weekend coming up. Um, it is the opening of the pit for oh. the season. <laughs> <laughs> and we have extended hours like we have never had in, in modern history uh, oh, for the fun. pit. So we have um, every, every Saturday um, and Sunday expanded hours 
um, on the second and fourth Sunday of the month and every Wednesday as well. So please get your permits from Town Hall if you haven't already, and I'll see you down there uh, on Saturday. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, we're expecting a video. <laughs> it's entirely possible. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Chines. Uh, just a, a couple of things I wanted to mention. Uh, first of all, uh, the Gator Gallop uh, benefiting the Greenwood PTO is coming up on uh, April 9th, so a week from Saturday uh, at 8 o'clock at Lake Quantapowitz. So uh, good, uh, good chance to get out there and enjoy that. Um, I also did want to recognize, we, we didn't cover this at our last meeting, but uh, this past St. Patrick's Day was the 100th anniversary of the cornerstone laid for the BB Library, yeah. um, which is really kind of a neat piece of history that, um, you know, I, I, I think is a, a great part of the legacy that the library has uh, here in the community. I know they're going to be doing a, a number of things throughout the year uh, to kind of recognize the centennial, but uh, really is something that, uh, again, I think we should all be proud of and uh, be happy to celebrate. And then finally, just wanted to mention that the uh, Disabilities Commission uh, is hosting a screening and discussion of the film Intelligent Lives, uh, actually at the Galvin uh, on April 11th at, uh, at 6.30. So if you're not at this meeting, a uh, great opportunity to take part in a, in a great discussion. And you know, one that I think is, is something that's really timely as we talk about um, you know, some of the movies that were recognized last night at the Oscars and so mm. forth. Um, you know about uh, the the lives of individuals with different disabilities and uh, and uh, you know the the impact that they have on our on our world. And I figured we would catch that on replay, but they cannot video record yeah. it yeah. just because of licensing. So if right. people want to see it, they really yeah. need to go that yeah. night, which I think yeah. is good because there'll be a lot of discussion. Yeah. Absolutely. So while we're going to miss it, we hope everybody else mm -hmm. gets to go. Um, I mentioned it earlier, just wanted to thank Sherry and Steve and Julie for the volunteer event earlier today. 192 volunteers? Uh, I think that's what the number comes I, to. I, 190 we have in our town. Um, and everyone does such great work as we had um, Benny Wee, co-chair of the Human Rights Commission. Everyone who volunteers in our town goes above and beyond and everyone got these buttons. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're going to soup into it, but all volunteers got this great button. You got it, Ryan? <laughs> awesome. Um, so we just I just did want to take a moment to thank the organizers of that. Ed started it a couple of years ago. Glad that we um, were able to do it again. I think it'll be an annual tradition. It was so. very nice. So um, thank you. Um, I reminded um, last meeting, and I'm going to do it again, if you want a community garden plot, um, applications are due by April 1st. We have over 80 applications. Two of us at this table have applied. Yeah. Three of us. <laughs> nice. Um, Steve, if you need another location for a garden, I it's am. a great location. <laughs> I'm going to sell um, plots in my yard. You can right. but, uh, <laughs> I have not won yard. one yet. So, <laughs> so um, it is, it is, you know, one of my favorite things in town. Um, and uh, April 1st, and then there'll probably be an online lottery is how Dan kind of runs it, so everyone to know that. And then just um, to let everyone know, the month of Ramadan for Muslims starts April 2nd. It's our month of um, fasting from sunrise to sunset. So um, please be nice to your Muslim friends who are <laughs> fasting. Um, but um, it's a great, it's a contemplative spiritual um, month with a big celebration at the end. So stay tuned about the celebrations. Anyone else? Oh, sorry. No? One other thing. Yeah, sorry. Sure. I, I forgot to mention uh, the master plan workshop coming up. And uh, thanks to Councillor Danahy for her work uh, on that as well. But uh, April 6th at 6.30 on Zoom, great opportunity for people to get Thank involved. You, Jonathan. Uh, particularly as, as we're thinking about, you know, what do we want the town to look like and how do we take the work that we did in Vision 2030 and really carry that forward uh, in terms of a, a coherent and comprehensive plan for Wakefield? Yeah, and the advisory group has been really wonderful. It's been a it's been a fantastic group led by the MAPC. So it, I'm really I'm looking forward to it. Okay, Steve, Tom, Jerry, anybody? No, no. all good. Thank no? you. Okay, um, matters not anticipated for the agenda. Steve, I did just want to get an update on the oil spill in, on the Mill River. Yes. So. Um, over the weekend, um, I was out um, looking at the Mill River. Um, I believe Friday afternoon, the chair was out there as well. So basically, um, what did happen is there was a, um, uh, a kind of a spill that occurred 
um, a few weeks ago in the um, water and farm street area it was mainly diesel fuel and it did uh, get cleaned up by a company uh, Commonwealth Tank and apparently some of the residue got into some of the storm drains mm -hmm. and hadn't been you know completely um, removed so with all of the um, rain the past few days um, th this kind of came up and went and decided to go down the Mill River so our fire department, uh, DPW, particularly Deputy Chief Purse, uh, Purcell, Tommy Purcell, was out there uh, uh, with the um, representatives from DEP and Commonwealth Tank. Uh, more, I call them berms. I know that Julie calls them booms. Call them booms. booms. Yeah. Um, they were put out there. They uh, DEP is um, handling the uh, or supervising the remediation. Uh, they will revacuum and walk, wash out the storm drains mm -hmm. as uh, they're also going to go up and down the river, really down the river, to free up and clean various pockets of debris and oil that has gone down there. So I think a really good response by our uh, fire department um, and our uh, DPW guys who did go and walk a lot of the river, you know, both ways to make sure that, hey, you know, where did this happen? Because there's always a question, you need to isolate it right. in where it happened. and. Uh, Getting DEP out there right away was uh, was great. So, the town is on it. I know that might have been some scuttlebutt about where or when it came from, but it was um, a uh, kind of a, a diesel spill from a from a truck that was being filled up um, at uh, in, in that water and farm area, more towards Wiley Street. Thank you. Any questions? Or just confirming, you just said that, but nothing to do with 383 nothing Water Street. Nothing to do Street. with that, yeah. Okay. I didn't want to single out the individuals, but nothing to do with but that. But nothing to Absolute do with that. zero. Great. Zero. We actually walked that to make sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Any other matters not anticipated? No? Um, okay, so we can adjourn. <coughs> Our next regularly scheduled meeting is Monday, April 11th at 7 p.m. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second of Moved by Vice Chair Butt, seconded by Councillor Santos. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries seven to zero. Thank you very much. We'll see you on April 11th. Thank you.